Hello, hello. Hey, everyone. Can everyone hear me first and foremost? I see um, Aaron got y'all laughing in the chat already. <laughs> everyone hear me though? Is it clear? Okay, great, BB. Thank you, the great family. I see everyone. Hey, Carla. Hey, Janae. It was Janae's fault. I'm late. <laughs> it's like I'm just playing. Um. Hey, King Birdie, Jasmine. Hey. I promise y'all, like, this is only my second live. I'm going to figure this whole thing out. I waited until, like, five minutes ago to figure out how to do something. <laughs> so that's why, you know, it is what it is. That's why I'm here late, but. How's everyone doing? How was your week? Hey, Queen. Hey, Rain, Bianca. Yes, all is well. All right, Aaron. See you in a minute. Hey, Gaia. Oh, thank you, Supreme. Love you, too. I forgot to share this on my IG, y'all. See, I'm just so behind. Like, I'd be waiting to... Okay, let me just... Um, somehow, some way, let people know I'm live real quick. But how are you guys doing, though? Danny, you need some good vibes? I feel you. I really feel you. Well, I'm going to let you know that there will be hope in this live. There will be um, good vibes in the chat and in this live, throughout this live. But there will be some triggering things. Because um, today, um, I'm sure you guys have seen, I'm, I'm discussing my experience, um, my time in carbonation. Um And I'm kind of going to say, I mean, I'm I'm going to probably say a lot of things people already know, but then there also might be things that you haven't heard and or don't know about or um, whatever. But yeah, this isn't, um, not all of it's going to be, pre I'm going to try to like be cautious because, I mean, even though I'm giving this warning, I don't want to anything to be really offensive or anything. I'm not probably, I'm probably not going to say a lot of people's names, um, except for unless they're still in the cult. Uh, I'll just try to keep that to a certain, I don't know. I'm a, I'm a keep, keep that in mind because I just know things are sensitive and I, I'm not into, you know, putting folks out there. Um, too much, you know what I mean? Hold on, let me post this, y'all. Sorry if you're on the replay and you're listening to this and you're like, what is going on? Just get past this part. <laughs> That's the best I can do for you right now. Just uh, let's get past this part. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get it right. One day I'm going to have the music. I'm going to have the little um, background, backdrop. I'm going to get it right. But right now, uh, this is what it's going to be. Okay. Yay. Okay, I did it. <laughs> okay. 
All right, let's see. Hey, Taylor. <laughs> okay, Danny, will do. But yes, like I was saying, um, <laughs> somebody said no music. Um, it's it might be some triggering things. I know if I'm going to be triggered, I know I'm going to protect my mental um, and pause or move on, you know, or just be like, I'm not talking about that. Um, because I know like this is real life sensitive things that, um, yeah, it's not always easy to talk about and hear about or to even for me to like go back and think about in certain, in certain moments. So yeah, I feel prepared today. I took a lot of time to prepare for this. Um, but yeah, at any point in time where I'm going to take care of me. So, you know, you take care of you. Um, and yeah, that's just put that out there first, um, because everyone who knows about carbonation, the cult carbonation, uh, knows that a lot of horrific things did occur on and off camera. Um, Elysio Bishop is not in prison for no reason he did not get life without parole for no reason he's in there because of the crimes he committed and you know a lot of people feel like he he's getting punished for everything even though that stuff is not wasn't even um brought up on the charges like there's things that he wasn't charged with that he's definitely done it's done a lot of harm a lot of harm and um I'm here to talk about, I feel like I never really shared my experience from beginning. Like a lot of people kind of maybe have heard that video, the interview um, that me and Aaron did with the T. Um, but I don't even, I feel like then I was in a whole different um, space mentally. I really had just like just left the cult um, mentally. So it was really not, <laughs> I don't know. I haven't listened to it in a while. I said a lot. I mean, I think we said a lot of things and, um, but there was a lot of things I didn't really understand yet. And yeah, so I wanted to share. There's a lot of things too, that I ended up remembering at that time when I did that interview, I like my memory wasn't, I didn't have as much, um, as I talk about it. And as I, um, process everything a lot of things come back to me so yeah yeah I agree Erin I don't think we were as clear as we are today yes I got my notes <laughs> yes I got my notes BB come on I can't use my notes thank you Moni And yes, let, yes, Janae, thank you for your bravery. Everybody who is so brave and courageous, thank you. I'm glad you guys are here with me. Um, let's get started. So, hold on. Let me get my notes. <laughs> uh, yes, I was so inspired to do this live because Aaron, if you guys have not subscribed to Aaron, um, he has a great channel here on YouTube, and he um, went live. Um, he basically broke down and um, really explained some of the things that uh, the remaining cult members, um, formerly known as the wives, but now I guess they're the family members, <laughs> but we'll refer to them as uh I refer to them as uh, Malia Tanisha. I mean, Malia, Efru, and uh, Aya. I think it'll just be easier for me to do that in this live. And I think if you don't know, I mean, if you don't know who they are in relation to their real names, I think most of us do. But Malia is her real name is Tanisha. Kayla, her real name is Efru, and and Aya, her real name is Porsche. But I'm going to just refer to them as their cult names. Um, so he he did the live where he was basically breaking down everything they were saying in the Fox 
what was it, 26, Fox 26 interview. And I was just inspired because I'm like, he talked a little bit about how the women had no control over the finances. You know, they said a lot of things and they were lying about it. And it was just like, wow, it got me thinking about what it was like to be a woman in carbonation where you, it was just, it was a lot different, I think, from the men. Um, yes, the men experienced a lot of trauma and a lot of harm too. But I think I've seen a lot of things, especially me being there for five years, almost five years, and um, just never leaving, <laughs> you know, and, and even though, you know, wanting to leave many times, and I'll talk about that, but even never actually leaving and then having a child and um, getting married and like, you know, not being um, one of his wives, I, I don't know, like more so being what he would call a concubine. And like, I just have a different perspective of um, everybody does. Everybody has a unique perspective of what they experience. But I was like, I need, I, I just feel like I need to share mine. So I will in hopes that like, it'll bring more people to the educational you know, information about cults and, you know, what it's like inside of a cult from a former cult member's perspective, especially a sex cult being a woman, you know, it's a lot of, it's a lot of things that um, I feel like, you know, people would be um, interested in understanding. So, yeah. Hey, Lisa. Hey, Medea. I see y'all. So I can hear a jaw yelling. Y'all can hear that too, huh? It's okay. But yes, let me, hold on, let me wipe my, I'm drinking tea. Um, that is a long time. <laughs> Five years is a long time. <laughs> so yeah. I want to start with what my life like looked like before carbonation. Uh, so I know before, yes, I heard Zoka got out today. That's great news. I bet it was miserable in there. Um, So yes, so before carbonation, what did my life look like? <laughs> so uh, I graduated high school. I got my tissues ready, Lisa. Um, I, I graduated high school um, and I, right out of high school, went to Howard University um, and I only went there for my first year of college. Um, that's where I first got like my taste of freedom because I grew up just a little background of my childhood. I had a great childhood uh, raised by my mother and um, also my uncle and my aunt. Were, I was very close with them. Um, I'm just pretty much like their first daughter <laughs> and then my cousin was born and we were like sisters basically. So grew up traveling. We went to Disney World, Disneyland, all types of places. My uh, my uncle and my aunt took me to um, Belize and Mexico, like all these different places and Canada. And like, I just got to travel as a child. I was like, always knew to how to get on a plane <laughs> and go. Um, had a big, I have a big family. Um, some of my family lived down South. Um, some of my family live in Washington. So um, a lot of us live in Washington. We were always close. Like, I'm, we're the type of family that gets together on the weekends, um, has Sunday dinners, all that. Um, goes out for everyone's birthday. Everyone's birthday, we go out. <laughs> um, and we just, yeah, we love to celebrate each other. Um, we're very supportive of each other. Uh, all holidays, yes, spent with each other. That's the type of family I grew up in. 
um, never grew up around any predators or anything, never had any like childhood traumas and stuff like that. Um, besides, I mean, I got whoopings a couple times, which, you know, that's a trauma. We, that's a trauma. We're going to acknowledge that. Um, and I think that I did feel like I was a quiet kid. I was very quiet. Didn't talk. I was told by <laughs> this woman that was like a fake auntie to me that um, I don't say fake auntie. She was like a pretend auntie. She was like, you didn't talk to me till you were like 10. <laughs> like, oh, really? I was very quiet. And a lot of uh, my family members said that I wouldn't even talk to anybody unless it concerned food. So there's that. Um, so, yeah, very observant and quiet kid. Um, went to good schools. Um, and then and I have an older sister. And we grew up like we're seven years apart. So, yeah, we grew up like interest. It's an interesting relationship because she's way older than me. <laughs> and so she kind of bossed me around. But I love my sister. She was so cool to me all the time growing up. And yes. And then I have my cousin who I was super close to. And um, yeah, like just very normal I feel like <laughs> childhood and then got to high school high school was cool I was like a cool kid <laughs> in high school <laughs> um I just knew everyone and yeah I like made friends pretty easily and then my after my sophomore year of school of high school I moved and um, to somewhere that was far away <laughs> in my mind at that age. I'm like, this is so far away from all my friends. Um, but it was really just like a 30, 45 minute drive, but I didn't go to the same school anymore. So I didn't have any friends at my new school. I went to a pre predominantly white school for my last two years of high school. I was, so I was kind of a loner, um, made a couple of friends, but it was just like nothing like my old school. But my mom really liked it because it was. she said it was a better education, yada, yada. Anyways, I graduated high school, did very well. Um, my One of my best friends um, from my other school, but we were still best friends, she was like, apply to Howard with me because I don't want to apply by myself. So I applied to Howard University, not actually knowing really much about it, but just and not knowing what I wanted to do in life, but just knowing that, hey, I'll leave with you. I'll get out of Washington. That's cool applied, got in, um, and she actually didn't get in, but I still decided to go. Um, my mom took me over there and like, you know, got my dorm room already. And I lived with two other girls in a dorm room, a very small dorm room. Dorm room. Uh, my first year of college, I did very terribly. I've pretty much <laughs> flunked <laughs> out of my first year of college. <laughs> And it's not, and it's just that I would like not go to class. I would forget my due dates. I got my first taste of freedom and I wowed out. Um, oh, by the way, I grew up in a, my family is very Christian. I grew up going to church like two, three times a week. So, and it was a Baptist church. Um, I did choir practice, dance practice, you know, I sang dance at church, acted at church, all types of things, Bible studies. Sunday school, you name it. I had a I had my church friends, I had my school friends. <laughs> so, yeah. Um So, yeah, sorry. I'm just like seeing if there's any feedback in the chat. Okay. So, yes. Um Where was I? Oh, yeah. So, when I got to college, I decided I didn't want to go to church anymore. And that was just my decision. I was just like, I didn't feel like I resonated with um, Christianity. Uh, and I didn't really know much about any other religion. Um, so I just decided, like, I'm just going to stop going to church and do my own thing and just kind of, like, be free spirit out here. And that's when I started um, smoking, <laughs> drinking. And um, a lot of my... Well, some of my friends back home were just like, you're changing. Like, this is not who you are. But I just like, wanted to have fun. Anyways, 
flunked out of my first year of college. Um, I was put on academic probation and then they told me I could come back um, if I got my grades up. So I pretty much cried that whole summer. <laughs> <laughs> and my mom was just like, we're going to suck it up and we're going to go, you're going to go get a job. <laughs> no, she, she, she consoled me and she took me right to the mall. So I'm going to get out the car, go get you a job, come back when you got one. And I did. And that's when I started working. Um, so I was 18, no, I was 19. Started working or I didn't even have my license. <laughs> so I was taking the bus to work or getting dropped off. And I just, you know, uh, went back to school, then ended up getting my license, um, getting a car, just like, you know, actually being adult in that. I feel like my first year of college, I was just like being a rebellious teenager. Then after that's when I started actually adulting. And then um, I still didn't know what I wanted to do in school. So that was a rough, you know, thing. I was, I think I was more focused on my social life still. Um, then I started dating a guy that I've that I'd known since um like sixth grade um and we were very close and um yeah and I got more introduced into a marriage Iwana and um more familiar I guess I should say and then we ended up moving in together about 2015 um and I actually got a different job where I got promoted into a manager position I was working for a active what do you call it like a sportswear retail store and um yeah I felt like for my age like I was doing pretty well but I still didn't know what I wanted to do in life <laughs> <laughs> and then I found um, this program that was, um, it was a apparel design program. And I was really into, I was always really into art and fashion. So ooh, let me get myself closer to the mic. So I was like, ooh, yeah, let's try that. And so I started learning how to sew, draft patterns, all types of things. I was learning a lot, but I think like my personal life and my social life was still very hectic and it was still a priority for me. Um, I didn't end up, I ended up like passing all my classes until the very last class and I had to pass the very last class to get into the program. So yeah, that was devastating, I must admit. But I didn't get into the program. So I would have to like wait to the whole next fall to get into the program. And so here I am just like felt like I was stuck and I had just quit my job because I felt like mentally drained and I also had seen a couple videos um one video I saw was of the group uh that was Millenation at the time Bishop was not in the video and they were speaking knowledge they were talking about how life is sex <laughs> that's crazy right like what like why would you I don't know they said, you know, they obviously they made it clear that it was an acronym and that it meant sacred energy exchange. And they were saying life is a sacred energy exchange. You know, you're always in communication with everything, the environment, people, everything. And um, so, you know, your food, everything is you're in constant communication with it. And I was just like, wow, that's a great, you know, way of putting things like I resonate with that. And so, and by the way, one of my friends who I was close with at the time actually is the one who shared that video on her feed, like on the, the public, on the news feed on um, Facebook. So when I saw her share it, I was like, oh, let me see. I only like had like 30 friends on Facebook. I'm like, oh, let me see. And then I watched it and then I texted her and I was like, thank you for sharing that video because I now know my purpose in life. <laughs> and she's just like, okay, great. <laughs> like she doesn't real. I don't know if she realized like what I was saying in that moment. Like I was like, I belong with them. And so, but that was in May of 2017. So that whole summer I still worked and you know, did my thing. But then when I fell, and I was in school, but then when I failed that last class and I quit my job, it kind of like 
put me in this position where I wanted to actually go back to the internet and see what was out there. Um, by the end on the in my personal life in my relationship, it was very rocky at this point. There was drugs involved and um, a lot of emotional immaturity, a lot of financial <laughs> immaturity, just a lot of immaturity, right? I don't think to young adults who don't know themselves or understand that damn anything <laughs> should be living together. <laughs> but I think we, you know, when I was young, I thought I knew it all, which I'm sure a lot of people can relate to. And I thought, we got this. Yeah, we're going to get married and start a family. Ah, we got this. And it was good until it wasn't, you know. But um, my mom and my family always really supported me. They always just wanted me to, like, be happy and be able to, like, support myself. As long as I was, like, cool and safe and I felt like I could support myself. And um, they were they're even, like, the type of people that will help you out, like, you know when you when you need it but they want you to also help yourself at the same time so I was always taught to be independent to make sure I had my ducks in a row um but I was I felt like I was very financially um immature and I did made a lot of mistakes and I also was emotionally just immature I didn't know how to handle being in a relationship with somebody um also just being I was a um like a lot of people know that I was a virgin and um, that's not, it's something that at first I chose. And then after a while it wasn't, it was just like my body wasn't doing what I wanted it to do. <laughs> and um, the only advice I was given from like professionals were to do things that I felt like I didn't, I wasn't comfortable with. So um, yeah. Yeah. So um, without going into much detail into that, I just felt like I didn't know. I just felt lost, honestly. Like, I just felt lost. And um, I wanted to get into veganism. Um, I had tried it a couple times. Um, I wanted to learn more about just my body, life. Um, I started following this like yoga, this Egyptian yoga practice. I wanted to go to Egypt. <laughs> it was probably another cult. I don't know what it was, but it was like these people who were going on this retreat in Egypt. And if I would have had the money at that time, I definitely probably would have just like done it. But I didn't. Um, and then I it's like I wanted to make like a drastic change. I felt like I'm about to be 24 years old. Like something's got to give. I felt like, you know, all my friends were about to start graduating from college. Meanwhile, I'm still like don't even have an, any type of degree. And I just quit a job that I was working for three years. So it's just like I just felt displaced. And I started working another job and then I got a job interview. I got the job interview. I uh, found out I got the job probably actually the day that I left to join Carbonation is the day I was supposed to start that job. <laughs> but um, that's just an interesting thing. I think, or I think it was the mon the next Monday. I think I left on a Saturday. It was that Monday I was supposed to start. But yeah. Um, oh, I was growing my hair freeform locks since the beginning of 2017. So my hair was freeformed, and then at the end of November 2017, I cut all my hair off <laughs> because I felt like I was getting a lot of attention from um, people that I didn't like. Uh, like I would be working, and people would be like, "Why you like? Why your hair?" Like uh, they would be looking at me funny um, because I'm. It's obviously like just freeform locks are just you're not combing your hair out. <laughs> you're washing your hair, and you're not combing it out. I was having people tell me like you need to put some oil in your hair like people and then I was getting a lot of reactions from men um that were like oh what's up my sister oh you know and it was just like I just felt like I just wanted to <laughs> grow my hair out I don't want to it just felt like I had to be something um and then it felt like people already had this perception of me 
because I'm wearing wooden earrings with my freeform logs, you know, like I'm this soul sister or something. I don't know. And then I kind of was becoming that because that was like what was um, the guy I was with. He was showing me these hidden color videos. I don't know if you guys ever heard of hidden colors, but he was putting on all these tapes for me. And he was like, yeah, like the system is corrupt. And <laughs> I don't like to think that he, you know, I, he was misinformed too. But, um, I, you know, I respected him and I, uh, you know, we had a lot of history. So when he was showing me these things and he was also like, it was hard for him to find work. And he was like, cause it's cause I'm a black man and you know, all this stuff. And I was like, dang, like, I didn't know it was like that out here for black men. Cause I don't have a lot of black men in my family and the black men that I do have in my family, they're, they do well for themselves. I mean, yeah so I was just like oh wow it's like that out here and like even when I went to Howard it was like you know Howard is HBCU and they were teaching us like yeah you know the white people out here they you know you have to compete and I'm just like oh wow I didn't grow up with the ideas of this separation of like I had to be something different because I was black or I had to try harder or that I had to be at war with white people. So in 2017, I, that's when I started to develop this, like, I would call it a hatred um, because it wasn't, I don't feel like it was of any logic. I just think I started to not like white people, especially because of the things in the media about black people being killed and all these things. I don't know if I can say that, but yes. So he says actually because he can't read and don't show up on time <laughs> and it's crazy because like ugh, it's crazy because it's like there's things that I can clearly see now and I'm like I was complaining about things in life and I, a lot of people that I know were really struggling in life because of their own they were they were doing it to them like they were doing it and I was putting myself in position like I was struggling financially but I'm spending my money on you know like rolling it up in a piece of paper and lighting like it is it, just ridiculous but neither here nor there um but yeah so at that point he cut I told him I was like I want to cut my locks off he cut my locks off because I I felt like I wanted to get back into the workforce and just like be looked at differently and right after he cut my locks off y'all I was I curled up and I just cried and I'm like I look like a boy. I was going through like, I was going through a lot and um, nothing would help. Like the, the um, marijuana made it worse. Everything was just like making it worse. So I was, I would say like, it was a form of, I mean, I felt like I was, yeah, I think it was a form of depression. I was, I remember there was a point where I didn't want to go outside. Um, that was threatening to harm myself and I was harming him I was harming the guy I was I was with um physically I did physically harm him um and and I was very I was just harm I was hurtful and then um um something happened to where yeah you know, this whole thing happened and I ended up we ended up going our separate ways but that was devastating for me um and I just didn't, I couldn't picture my life without that person at that time. So just like the, I felt like the things that at that time, the Melanation members and um, Bishop was preached, because I ended up going back online and seeing the lives and being a part of the lives and stuff. And, you know, I felt like it was giving me some type of purpose, basically, and something to strive for like oh look you know you have astrology this is how you get to know yourself because I just felt like I was hitting dead ends like what is my purpose in life why am I here why what even is this you know and that's it's funny because that's some that's the three questions that he says you that bishop would say you would ask if right before you reach enlightenment which some people may still believe I don't I don't but um yeah, I was asking myself those questions and I did shout out <laughs> loud, please, I want to find my purpose. Just let me find my purpose. So 
Um, and around that time, listening to his videos and the things he was saying, it resonated with me. The laws of my yacht, the laws of nature, him saying that we needed to go back to a natural state. This was the cause of, this was the root of all of our problems. The reason why we were suffering is because we're chasing after money. We're selling our soul to go to work, to then have money, to then just go give it back to the bank. And it's this whole cycle. You know how people call it the hamster wheel. And I related to that. I felt like I was in a cycle of just like nothing's happening for me that I, you know, and you have to work when I'm just sidebar, you have to work for what you want. I now accept, you know, accountability and responsibility for my life and where I'm at. And instead of being a victim or being like, Oh, what was me? I look at like, okay, let me, this is where I am right now, realistically. And if I want to get somewhere, I got to put the work in it's attainable, but I got to put the work in. So that's a little sidebar, but that's from, me now growing into, you know, being more mature. This 24 year old version of me was very immature and very much not understanding why things weren't just happening. <laughs> so, um, you know, what Bishop was preaching was so intriguing because all I needed to do was submit to nature and the will of nature. And, um, which was like, let God's will be done, you know, like get back in tune with the earth, just go ground and, eat from the earth. So I did that. I went outside. I would sit in the sun. Um, not in November, but I was doing that in the summertime. Um, I was doing that, you know, in September. Um, but, and I was eating, excuse me, I was eating mostly fruits. Um, I don't think I was eating a healthy diet. I was eating mostly fruits um, and I would only eat at 12 noon because that's what he would preach, um, that we need to eat when the sun, the sun is at its peak, it's at its highest. So yes, I was doing some of the things that he was teaching before going. He was telling, he was saying that the water that's coming through the plumbing system in your home is filled with fluoride and chemicals and pharmaceuticals. And so to avoid that, because that's killing your melanin he would say like that's damaging your DNA and your melanin. Um, you need to just use bottled water to bathe and to um, brush your teeth and things like that. So I literally had a jug of water in the bathroom and he would say like, you only use Dr. Bronner's soap. I was already using Dr. Bronner's soap. So yeah, that's what I did. I did that at home before even ever like talking to them, you know, or um, at all. And then he started um, when he when he was talking about like how we can give back to nature, he would say like we are a part of nature's ecosystem. We have been giving our um, waste, I'll say that like our waste, what comes out of us after we eat and drink. We've been giving it back to the plumbing system, but that's all wrong. We need to be giving it back to the earth because that's where our food comes from. That made a lot of sense to me, and I wanted to see how I could incorporate that into my life. He would say like, when you give back to nature, blessings flow to you because you're now more in harmony with the earth rather than working against it. They, I mean, I I really resonated with that at that time. I don't resonate with that now, um, but I really resonated with that at that time in my life. So I would go outside to my backyard, hoping nobody saw me and I would do it. You know, um, not every time, but I would do it just to see how it felt. And the one time that I did do it, um, I saw this rabbit. <laughs> this is crazy. I saw this rabbit and I swear, like, I wanted what, what he was saying to be so real, you know, for me. So it was like when I would, I just felt like everything was a sign. And I was seeing the, I saw the rabbit and I was like, oh, wow. I never see rabbits, <laughs> you know? And then I remember going out into the forest, like near the stream. I had never been out there before, but when I got out there, I used the bathroom and I, I and then I, I, um, I dug a hole and I used the bathroom. It was near a tree. And then I covered it up and I prayed to, I guess, mother earth. And I was just like, please, um, um, take me home. 
because that's what he would call nature. It, you know, that's what he would call, um, really, that's what he would call the cult is home. So I'd be like, take me home. I want to go home. And like, take me to Mother Nature, you know? Um, because it's obviously cold in Washington, you know, it's North America, <laughs> it's the so, and it's the Northwest, you know, like it's cold. And so I'm like, yeah, take me to the tropics. And um, a couple days later is when I get the, like I get a message. I actually got a message from, um, his name was Ohm at the time, Tron. I got the message from him on my birthday. And he's just like, hey, peace, God. And I'm like, oh, no one's ever called me God before. <laughs> like, peace, like, okay. And, um, you know, I obviously understood some of the teachings about everything is God uh, and agreed with that. And then, you know, we started talking. He, he was asking me about my birth chart, getting our compatibility and all that. Ended up, um, he ended up saying like we were really compatible I ended up learning. He said that with everyone. <laughs> hey, the T. Um, and uh, yeah, everybody was compatible with everybody. Let's just say that. But anyways, I um, looking back now, it was things that were going on between us in, in those messages that was very inappropriate. And if I... It would have been in my right mind <laughs> to begin with. <laughs> like, I would have seen that as, like, clear red flags, but I didn't. And so um, when he FaceTimed me or he, uh, you know, video chatted me and uh, Eligio got on the phone, he's like, you need to come here now. If you're trying to come, you got to get here now. I was like, wow. I felt like it was an hour never type of situation. I had a brand new car that I was um, leasing. And I was just like, started researching how I, you know, I could leave that car or if I could take it with me and just drive to Belize. Well, I decided to leave the car. And um, over this course of like literally a couple of days, y'all, this was on the 5th when he messaged me that the rest of that week was me selling my clothes. And my family, like they didn't really notice what was going on, but I was like in my room on the computer and I wouldn't even go to sleep sometimes. And I would just only come out the room to <laughs> freaking eat <laughs> and use the bathroom. And I started looking at, and he was preaching, Bishop was preaching that like your family and everybody that's not chosen and doesn't hear this message, they are like bots, they're robots, they're programs, and they just, they're never, like, they're not in, they don't, they're not in tune, like, they don't feel this message, so it's not in them, so don't waste your time explaining it to them, just get away from them, so it's weird, I think when you, a part of me, like, when I started believing that, I really started seeing that, if you understand what I'm saying, I believe that. So like when I would see my family, I would look at them and I'd be like, oh, they're bots. Like they're programs. That's why they're doing that. Oh my God. <laughs> like, and so it was, yeah, even before like, I was being indoctrinated, definitely just right there in my home, just watching those videos. That's why I speak out about this because the YouTube channel is still up there. They're still out here preaching online. It's very real and it can't happen it's not just weak-minded or naive individuals it's it just individuals searching for something in fact cults need don't need you to be naive and and weak they need you to be mentally strong because a cult leader wants to feed off of intelligent people so yeah i i just know that it this doesn't what the me getting indoctrinated into this cult is not telling of my intelligence it's more so just telling of my state of mind at this point in my life so I think that just me being lost and not knowing who I was is the reason why I was attracted to something that was telling me who I was and telling me what the life was and um and I just agreed and then I started to see that in my life there was a point when Tron was like 
quizzing me about the knowledge. And he was asking me if I knew certain things. And I'm like, yeah, like I know what that means. You know, he specifically asked me about the holographic universe. He was like, explain the holographic universe. And I just was like dumbfounded. <laughs> and he was like, no, I don't think you should come because you don't know the knowledge. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like I already bought my ticket. I'm going to figure it out. <laughs> so I, um, I figured it out. Like I just stayed up all night watching the holographic universe and watching um the 13th floor. I don't know if y'all know about that movie, The 13th Floor. Everything that Bishop put out there for people to watch to become enlightened, I was watching it. Except I didn't really go into the YouTube. I didn't I didn't go on YouTube. I was mostly just um like I was on YouTube, but I didn't like explore YouTube. So I didn't see people talk speaking out about him. I never saw no hate. I never saw no counter narratives. That's another reason why I do these lives um, and speak out because there has to be a counter narrative. I never saw no counter. And I know there that was available, but I didn't see it. It didn't pop up for me and I didn't watch any. I didn't go searching for it. So I was strictly going off of what he was saying, what Tron was saying, and what I felt. And I was seeing, you know, numbers you know, in the spiritual <laughs> world. I mean, I don't want to make fun of that. I know some people still believe in that, but I don't really care. When I see 555 now, I'm like, okay, it's 555. But back then I was like, oh my gosh, I see, I've been seeing 1111 all day. This is a sign. So, um, but yes, on my birthday, like I said, my, my family always, we always celebrate birthdays. I didn't even want to leave the house because I was so reading my birth chart. But my family was like, we got to go out. It's your birthday. We got to go to the restaurant. And I'm like, oh, so I'm like, fine. If we go out, we have to go to a vegan restaurant. So I took my family to this vegan restaurant. Well, they took me for my birthday. And then I just remember thinking they don't realize that this is probably going to be the last time they ever see me. And, um, but I was just confident, like, I just was so confident that what I was doing and what I believed in was right. So I didn't even say anything to them. And I think maybe I wasn't that confident because if I was, I would have shared that with other people. Right. But, um, you know, Bishop was saying that you don't tell your left hand what your right hand is about to do. You don't tell your family and friends what you're about to do because they're going to try to talk you out of it because they just don't understand. So I didn't tell anyone. And um, on the 10th is when I left the uh, December 10th, 2017. That was um, actually my sister's birthday party um, that day. And um, yeah, I still kind of sad for me that I left on her birthday and she was so young and she didn't understand and um they just didn't understand why I didn't show up and it was because I was on a plane going to Texas and um I ended up like just blocking their numbers because I think I wanted to avoid all the calls that I knew I would inevitably get and I just wanted to focus on what was, I felt like was what was ahead of me. And um, yeah. And maybe one day I'll go more into depth with that and like write it out and stuff. But yeah. That was a very, like now thinking about it, like that was a very sad moment. And I wrote a letter um, and they actually kept it. <laughs> I don't have it anymore though. I had to throw it away. I was like, this is crazy. But it was just, it was a small piece of paper and it said like, I'm going to fulfill my purpose. God is in you all and I love you. I love myself or something like that. And they kept it. And on the back of it was names of the members. I don't know if they wrote that, like if one of my family members wrote that or if I did. But yeah, I recently saw that. Like when I got back, I saw that they had kept it. So 
Anyways, I get to Texas. Hold on, let me breathe, y'all. <laughs> Cause like that is just really when it comes to my family, I just like it's really. Uh. Okay, I, I'm not gonna cry. I'm not gonna cry. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. Hold on, I gotta get me a bite of this. <sighs> One thing, one thing that, hold on. Okay, one thing that Bishop did say to me, and I said it in my testimony when I was on that video chat with him and Tron, he said, oh, because I have my camera flipped. I don't know why I have my camera flipped. And he was like, oh, you got a nice, oh, you got a nice house. And then I flipped it to me and he was like, oh, you're, yeah, you're pretty. And that, and then after that is when he told me to come on, get my ticket and come on. Cause they're about to leave and they're about to go to Belize. So, and I didn't have my passport at that time. So I knew that like, and, and he, and they were basically promising me that, once I got to Texas, they'd get me my passport really fast. Because, you know, if I would have tried to get my passport myself, it would have took me a long time to get it. Because passports just don't come that fast. Um, but I was, like, in a hurry, obviously. Because this was, like, my ultimate purpose. And he was saying it was urgent. The whole message was urgent. Let's just, you know, be clear about how the whole system was about to fall. <laughs> The system is falling. The earth is about to crumble. You better get out of there because you're chosen. So the whole message was very urgent. So I was just like, F it. I'm going to meet them in Texas and they're going to help me get my passport and all that. So I remember I listened to the same song over and over on my way to Texas. I was so nervous. Like, and the, the song I was listening to was like a Daniel Caesar song and it calmed me down like as much as I could be calmed down. I just kept listening to it over and over and over. Is that his name, Daniel Caesar? I feel like his name is not Caesar, but I just say that because, you know, I'm from Washington. This is how we talk. But I listened to that one song over and over. Got to the airport, sat there, waited for them to pick me up. I was talking to Tron, messaging him, and he was like, yeah, we're on our way. I cut there. He's like, yeah, we're here. I come outside and all 18 of them is standing there. <laughs> <laughs> and not that they're like they all just showed up like in the car they all got out of the car at the airport and I'm like hi <laughs> like and they're all smiling and there's kids with them there's two kids and um one of them was Osiris and there's people that I had never seen so I'm like okay like it's a lot of folks um, Tron was very tall. Bishop was very tall compared to me. I'm very short. I'm five foot. So I was like, but the women were all my height. Jeez, I keep, sorry, y'all. Um, but the women were all my height. So it was like strange because I had seen everybody online. Um, I had, uh, followed like I remember I followed um, a couple members at that time. Um, I didn't know Azul had left. I was following Azul because, um, no, I'm not going to say why I was following him. Well, yeah, he, he did a video and I, I liked the video. Uh, I've followed um, the women because ob for obvious reasons, I feel like I related to them. Um, there was pictures of them online at that time nude. And they covered their bodies. They're like their, um, you know, the sensitive areas. They covered it, obviously, because you're posting it on Facebook. 
Uh, and I just thought, wow, that's so liberating. <laughs> they were talking about how they didn't wear deodorant. And I know that sounds like crazy that, but I was already on the natural vibe. Like, yeah, that's natural. You know, um, that's nasty. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like not wearing deodorant for me now is like, that's nasty. But back then I was like, that's natural. And I know a lot of people still believe that in that stuff like that. So that's just, it's just, like I said, it's my opinion. That's nasty. But yes, um, at that time I was very much into the natural vibe. And I thought that was very, uh, it interested me how they thought about their bodies and how they thought about it. Like, their this just their avatar and it's not really like this sexual thing because I was having issues um with my like I guess identity sexually too so it was like okay well like I want to have that confidence in that um uh like I felt like they had a knowledge about it that I didn't so yeah that attracted me to the women there too um just like on a mental level and they all they looked happy they looked healthy to me at that time um um the men you know like uh, tron you know he was he was very nice he was you know he had some things that were very inappropriate about him but he was nice to me and um so yeah, I didn't I just didn't see things like if I were if I say things now that I see, it would be like now. I see them now. I didn't see them at the time. So there was clearly love bombing though when they picked me up from the airport. Um we immediately went straight to what do you call it? Like a FedEx or something where you can get your they have I think it was a FedEx. They took my passport photo there. And also the guys used the computers there and Bishop was telling them what to do. And basically what they were doing was they were <laughs> doing a scam. They were um, pretending like I had reservations at a hotel. They were booking like these, ho I don't know how they were doing it on the computer, pretending like I had reservations on a hotel so that I could get my passport expedited. Um, because if you, I guess, apparently if you have, they knew something about if you have a reservation in another country, you can get your uh, passport expedited because I guess you got to be there fast. So got my passport photo taken right then and there. They did that paperwork for that. And then um, and we're all, pretty much all of us were there, I believe. Maybe some people stay in the car, but a lot of us were inside. And then we went back to the house at that point. And when we got to the house, it was a one-story house. And um, damn, I think it was two bedrooms. But I honestly only went in one bedroom. I did not go in the other bedroom because we all slept in one bedroom. And um, it was connected to a bathroom. And they showed me, like, where to use the bathroom, which we all used the bathroom in the backyard. But like I said, at home, I was kind of starting to try that. So I understood why we did it and I was in agreement with it, but I was told how many squares of toilet paper to use. <laughs> were people following that rule? I don't know. And were other people given that rule? I don't know. They literally, I could have just been the only one that was told that. I don't even know. And yes, later on, like I would even say weeks later, it changed to we were using wipes and wipes only. We weren't even using toilet paper, but like, Yes, I know a lot of people were like, I wasn't, you know, it wasn't me. I wasn't using no two squares. That's, first of all, that's so small. But like, I don't even like to talk about it because it's petty. But I said that in my testimony to show that that was, like, it was rules about everything. And that was one of the rules that was given to me that I vividly remember. And I remember who gave it to me. And then, um... I remember he was standing in the bedroom when I went back there and 
all everybody had like their sleeping bags on the floor and he was standing there looking at me like I'm trying to figure out what to name you and in that moment I felt like he was a powerful person I thought like I was looking at a powerful person for real and I guess in a sense it was powerful he is powerful but just in to his own demise um but I thought I didn't see uh what I see now so um they told me about like cl the cleaning like just just helping out around the house sweeping and stuff like that and they told me basically like these are the women that cook in the kitchen um and so it was like okay and then it was funny because Osiris is actually the one who told me one of the rules <laughs> Osiris was probably about three years old and he was like we don't use the toilet and we don't use that water either pointing to the sink and we don't use that water either pointing to the uh the shower uh because it's poison that's what he told me and I was like okay Osiris because <laughs> I was already in agreement with that the water being poison um but that's how he was he was even teaching his son those things too and um there was another child there too but I don't know who that child like I don't know her and her mother I'm not going to talk about them but they were both there at that time they ended up that woman ended up calling um her people and like giving the address out I don't know if it was because she felt unsafe or what and there was a lot of people looking for her obviously she had a child there and there was allegations online that well, not even allegations. He was saying online that he was doing inappropriate things um, around his children. So people were worried about her and her child. FBI actually came to the house and interviewed Osiris and interviewed Bishop. And at that time, I had never actually heard the full video of him talking about his son. I never watched that video. Why? I don't even freaking know why I didn't watch that video I should have watched it but I didn't and so he I listened to what he said about it and the way he explained it was just like he doesn't shame his his children you know he doesn't shame them when they ask about body parts so I was like oh, okay that makes sense he doesn't shame them like because he doesn't want them to think they're bad I get that and then um he was like see they interviewed osiris he and they interviewed me they see nothing was wrong so in my mind i'm like nothing's wrong they interviewed osiris he's fine they investigated and he he told us we didn't hear the, the fbi guy talk he told us that the investigator said that he that that he understood what bishop was saying on the video and that he felt like people were taken out of context like <laughs> He told us that the FBI investigator said that. I believed that. I believed him when he said that. But looking back, I know he probably lied. Um, so Bishop ended up finding out that that lady exposed the location. And then that's the first time that there was like this intense meeting that I felt. And it was basically like all of us judging her, him verbally abusing her. And... um him going around the room and, and asking everybody to vote whether she should stay or go. I remember um, many people saying go, I said go. And by the time I said go and everybody else said go, some people said stay. He he told me that he was like, look, you already in tune because you, you also said go. So it was like, I don't know, I, I guess I was feeling like I was in agreement with what was going on and I was a part of the group. And I felt like with each moment passing, like I was more a part of the group. Um, he, Bishop actually um, told me like he wanted to do my eyebrows um, at this house and he wanted to line, line me up, line my hair up. And so he did. And then he, um, he wanted my pictures taken. And so uh, I got my pictures taken. He wanted me to post them. I posted them. And I basically posted him and saying, my name is Sheba now because he named me or whatever. And then um, that day he took us to the mall. And that's when I got like some stuff from the mall, whatever. We all got stuff from the mall. Oh, I missed a part though. Um, I gave my money to, to Keys. 
to Kitty at that time. And he, he told me if I had any funds to put it in the pot. So I gave him my cards and my credit card, my debit card and um, cash, whatever cash I had. And I don't know how much money I had because I still had money that was being deposited into my account for whatever reason. Uh, Cause I was selling stuff online and stuff like that. So I just gave the stuff to them. They went through my bag. Um, Tron found like I had sketchbooks and he's like, we don't do paper unless it's recycled paper. And so he threw it away. All my clothes, the women were like going through my clothes, <laughs> which is like a carbonation tradition, I guess. <laughs> they are going through my clothes and they're like, oh, I want to wear this, I want to wear this, I want to wear this. Girl, I only came with five outfits. Girl, by the third day, I ain't have nothing to wear. <sighs> awful. <laughs> it was awful. But I was like, we're a community. We share. They'll let me share. You know, and one of them let me wear what they had. So I was like, cool. Cool. And then, yeah. And then, of course, we went to the mall and bought more clothes. So when we went to the mall, I felt like, oh, okay, so look, I get to spend money. You know, because even though I put my money in the pot, this is why I put my money in the pot. Because there you know when i want something i'll just get it you know all i have to do is you know yeah i'm not gonna be the one swiping the card or paying for it but basically it's paid for because i gave my money to the pot and i'm you know i'm eating we went to chipotle you know we had meals at the house uh they stopped at sprouts and stuff and we had meals yeah um we also had wine one night for whatever reason. I don't know what we were celebrating, but I remember I was poured a big glass of wine and I drank it and I got very sick. <laughs> Let's just say that. I got very sick. And then, yes, yeah, so this house, um, all of that happened at this house in Texas. And also what happened at this house in Texas um, is uh Two of the members that were in a relationship with each other got broken up by Bishop and Bishop said that one of them belonged to him. And if you know, you know. And um, he was very, dis I think Bishop was very hurt. I don't know if he was very hurt, but some women were leaving him. Some women were attracted to other men in the group. So he ended up saying like, oh, your, wo your woman is attracted to me and taking her to be with him I just remember she was crying and she was just like very confused shit I was confused I didn't know what was going on but I just felt like I didn't know enough to say nothing so I just was like I'm just observing maybe she do like him and she's trying to deny it I don't know I just remember that guy was very very upset by that and he ended up sleeping out trying to sleep outside in the cold in the same backyard that we, never mind <laughs> anyways he was out there in the cold and the guys went out there got him um well they were they wanted to like actually console him they were trying to console him because they i think they also felt like dang that was wrong what just happened to you bishop made this whole scene about y'all need to stop babying him and stop you know coddling him like he's like he's hurt or something this is a spiritual journey you got to be equipped and da -da 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 -da. so basically that guy was left to just like deal with his hurt and he was told that his he was only hurt because he was in his demons and all the rest of that stuff like I said I didn't feel like I knew enough to interject into the situation at all and then the women side of it the women had a whole nother heap of problems I knew off rip off the when I was at the FedEx I didn't want to be with Tron so I'm in my mind trying to figure out how do I move now because this man's trying to push up on me. He's trying to be, and I don't want that. I don't want to be with him. So, but it just does. It didn't feel like like I, I just I just felt like I couldn't really use my voice there because I didn't. I feel like everybody was smarter and knew more than I did. So we were at this meeting, and I didn't sit next to Tron because I didn't want to. You know, I didn't want to really be around him, and. I didn't do it on purpose and um, you know, to me it wasn't on purpose, but I sat next to another member of the group and it was a male member and um, Bishop was like, you need to um, peep. No, they, he was like, peep where she's sitting y'all peep where she's sitting. And everybody's like, mm -hmm, yeah, I see it. 
And I'm like, what does everybody see? So I just thought like everybody is more spiritually attuned. And so I ended up coming out that the reason I was sitting where I was sitting is because I actually wanted to be with the guy that I was sitting next to. And I didn't want to be with Tron. And I denied it because I'm like, I don't know this man. <laughs> I do not know this man. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, but I ain't never seen this man. Um, and I, I mean, yeah, I don't want to be with Tron, but I didn't express that. So basically what ended up happening was I, I don't know. I don't even know what ended up happening, really. I stayed with Tron. I don't know what, what was going on. Oh, what ended up happening is one of another girl there ended up being with the guy I was sitting next to. So it was like this weird, I, already it was giving that type of cult, but I really didn't see it. Like, because I didn't have the knowledge of what these red flags look like. And then anyway, we started going, um, well, we, they bought, uh, we went to Walmart. They bought some um, solar panels off somebody, like in the parking lot. <laughs> I don't know. We bought some tents. Next thing you know, I got my passport. We was on the road. Went through Mexico. As soon as we were going through Mexico, I got physically sick. I was, yes, out of both sides, it was all coming out. And um, I had to keep pulling over because I, I was just sick. And then we got to Belize and I was still sick. So um, Bishop told us, and mind you, we made a lot of stops in between these, like stops where we would walk through like trees full of you know orange trees and stuff like that and go to the beaches and all these different places we went to a lot of different places in between going from mexico to belize beautiful places places i i hadn't experienced you know and um it was very beautiful and but during that trip is when i found out that um bishop was praying on me because i was a virgin and stuff like that but I just didn't really think none of it. I just like stayed with Tron. Uh, me and Tron really did have nice conversations and he was, he was a good friend. So I kind of just stayed with him just for comfort. Cause he was all I felt like I knew there. And then um, we got to Belize and we stayed on, where did we stay? Oh, we stayed in like this, this wooden house, like a, like a house that was in the woods kind of, but it was, we had neighbors and the neighbors were actually, I think the owners of the house we were staying in. So we were renting it from them. And it was kind of a tree house, like the way it was built because it was just wooden inside, like it, all of it was wood. And um, we had tents there and we still um, defecated outside and stuff like that. And people were getting sick. I was sick at first and um, then other members started getting sick. And Bishop was telling me that it was because of me. Because my energy was off. He was saying, like, it, your family probably, you know, you have this connection with your family. And because they're, it's like you, you, you miss them. And that's why you're sick. And they miss you. And that connection, that pool, that electromagnetic, you know, he trying to get all deep that electromagnetic pool is actually disrupting the frequency and it's the destructive interference that's causing everybody to get sick and I'm like oh that makes sense because you how would you know I'm close to my family right so you must be right because you didn't even you know you got the you just knew that so I ended up unblocking my family and that's when all the text messages and stuff came in I ended up seeing that I got like text messages from law enforcement asking if I was okay like ended up calling my family members and telling them like yeah I'm in Belize and my family they thought I was being drugged they thought they they didn't they did not agree um my mom was a, was one person that was just like are you okay are you happy are you safe okay cool she didn't know what it was she didn't know she did not recognize what was going on um yeah, so it was like, I was an adult. I mean, I am, I'm an adult at this point. At 24 years old, there was nothing they could really do. They did reach out. Huh? Oh, okay, well, hold on.
seen somebody say, yeah, what Lisa said. Y'all see what Lisa said? Yeah, what she said. <laughs> I'm just like, <laughs> um, I see somebody said that um, Aya was putting something in the food. So I wanted to say that um, at this point, no, um, Aya wasn't there. Uh, there was another cook. And if you've been watching for a long period of time or if you go back to the point in time where I'm talking about where we were in Belize, you'll see who the cook was. And um, she was the cook. And I and um, at this point in time, we were in Belize. I was the main helper in the kitchen. Like I helped, I did all the dishes and I chopped the vegetables and stuff for the meal. Um, there wasn't any like that. There wasn't any other women there. And then the other the other woman that was there, she was considered Bishop's wife, so she didn't work in the kitchen. And then um, the other girl was also considered Bishop's wife, and she didn't work in the kitchen. So, yeah, that's just how it went. So, yeah, me and her, she basically cooked alone for 15 people, and I basically washed all the dishes for 15 people. <laughs> that's how that worked. And... um. Yeah, so yeah, I don't I don't know. My 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 family did think that something was being put into the food. I personally like looking back, I'm even leaning towards we was probably getting sick because we shouldn't have all been around our own waste. I think that's very toxic to be around your own waste and then we all would do it in the same area as each other. So I think that's very toxic. So I, but at that time, I believe that it was my fault. It was my energy throwing everybody else off. So yeah, that's why I contacted my family for the first time at that point. And once I talked to them, I felt better because I felt like, you know, they weren't as worried anymore. And the only person that was very, very much upset was my ex at that time. He was very, very, very upset. Um, but I was like, we ain't, you know, it is what it is. I'm out here living my purpose. Now I'm living my life. And, you know, he already knew based off of the teachings that people weren't going to like what I was doing. You know, I already knew that. So I was just like, prepare, kind of preparing myself for that. But I have been there for quite some time. I would say like a couple months, maybe a month. I think I had been there for about a month, um, maybe a month and some when um, w this event happened. So what happened was the cook made some made some pizza, some vegan pizza, and Bishop didn't like it. And he decided to use that moment to make it like this huge big deal about how the energy in the food is off. And why would you serve this to me? Why are you, what, what is it? You know, it was her, I think it was like her first or second time making vegan pizza. That's not an easy thing to do, especially with the ingredients that you can, that you, we find in Belize, you know, but he was basically like saying it was trash and like, it was terrible. You know, you know how it feels when somebody say certain things about your cooking and then they make it and then they bring everybody else involved in it too and now you're just embarrassed you know like and then everybody feels bad and when he would do stuff like this everybody feels bad and like they can't eat it either because he doesn't like it and um in that meeting is when he started like he started screaming on me and saying that I, what what was my purpose for being here because I'm not making no videos I'm not proclaiming the kingdom before I came I didn't know that was a requirement I didn't know I had to get on camera I didn't know I had to do that, but he was saying like we all had to do it because it was to get the message out and to amplify the message. And each one of us, in order to fulfill our own personal divine purpose, we had to also proclaim the kingdom on our own. And I didn't know that before coming. So when he said that to me, I was like, oh, shit, like for real, like he was like, you I don't know why you're here. You're not doing anything. You're just you're just here. <laughs> like he's yelling at me and I'm like okay so literally right after that meeting and I really I think I just listened to him like even though he was yelling it would be like the next moment he'd be like and I'm only yelling at y'all because I love y'all 
and I want y'all to listen. I want y'all to be in your higher selves. And da, da, da. So I just listened. I didn't look, I, I tried not to be hurt by it. And I tried to look at it like he was trying to help us. So right after that meeting, I went outside and I tried to do a live video. But he was like, no, no, we're about to go to the river. You do it later. So anyways, I ended up doing my first live there at the house in Belize. Um, but my main role there was taking care of Osiris. That was my main role. Um, we get, We got kicked out of Belize. <laughs> I'll say this, we got ran out of Belize because um, Bishop was uh, spotted by somebody in town who knew of him and the things he had said online um, and the very disturbing things he said about what he did in front of his child and involving his child. And they were like, they, they made a, a Facebook um they basically brought attention to it on their Facebook like pages. You know, you can have like the groups and stuff. So basically Belize was, was rising up against Nature Boy. <laughs> like they were making all these posts. Like if I see this man, I'm going to off him. You know, I got my machete ready. Or they were just saying all types of stuff like hide your kids. Don't let your kids go outside. Like all types of things. And uh, right before we actually got kicked out or ran off and all this happened, we met up with another so-called tribe there, which is probably just another cult. Um, but we met up with them. They were a raw vegan, um, we'll just say village. Um, and all the ma all the women were kind of dressed all the same. Um, they were all scowling at us when they saw us. They were covered up from head to toe. Really, except no, they didn't have anything on their head, but they they wore like long, um, long clothes, long dresses, I guess they were. And the leader was, I guess he was blind and him and Nature Boy were like sitting face to face and like basically battling each other in their knowledge. And um, the women, like we were just like there. <laughs> behind him and then he had his the other guy had his women behind him and his children and stuff they had a lot of people in their village and they offered us food I think I might have had some of their food I don't know why I ate some of it. it was nasty and um yeah they end up bringing out their rules and like their their knowledge and saying that they use the bathroom in the outhouse and basically like i don't know it was like they were challenging each other on their knowledge who's more natural who's more in tune and, uh, uh, and yeah just weird stuff and then they ended up basically beefing so at the end of all it was just they ended up beefing so yeah, we got ran out of Belize. He was scared because he we left in the middle of the night. He told us pack everything up, <laughs> we're leaving. That was the first time I ever experienced a pack everything up, we're leaving right now. There was a lot of moments like that at Carbonation. That was the first time I ever had experienced that. It's literally like stop what you're doing, put everything in the boxes, like the the big storage boxes. Uh, take your tent down, put that you know <laughs> roll it all together, put your clothes in a bag, let's go. Get in the car, let's go. A lot of stuff you you have to leave because it doesn't fit in the car to go um, anywhere. Like, for example, Osiris had a bicycle. I don't think that bike. You know, it's like certain things like you can't take with you because you're just leaving. You're just up and leaving. Not to mention the fact that you got a child in the situation. Um, oh, and also at the house in Belize is the first time that Elijo ever exposed himself to me. And he also... Um, yeah, he did, he did things in front of me that were very inappropriate. Um, it wanted me to respond to them and I didn't, I didn't. So, yeah, that was weird. But like I said, most of the time I, my, uh, experience there in Belize at that house, the first house we were in was just taking care of Osiris. Um, I did a lot of <laughs> doing, uh, making his breakfast, making his tea, um, teaching him astrology, like we were teaching him the planets and stuff, um, teaching him about like the basics of biology and stuff. And then like just spending time with him, letting him watch it. Really, he liked watching Peppa Pig. So I would just let him watch Peppa Pig, go outside with him, ride his, you know, ride his bike, go on the swing, let him swing. Like I was literally like his caretaker, like his nanny. 
and then we went and um, we basically were like in hiding for a little bit. And then we came back into Belize. We were like on the border in like Mexico and Belize hiding. And then we went back into Belize. And that's when we lived on that plot of land that was near the water. And we had all the tents and we didn't have a house. Um, that was the first time that um, he told us, the women, that like it was okay to be nude. And um, we started wearing wraps only around our waist. And uh, we walked around like that because there was no one over there. No one could see us. You know, we did it. And we lived like right there on the wall. I mean, I have to say like, at this moment, I really felt like I had reached <laughs> like the most beautiful place. Like, I just felt like I was at peace at first. Um I wanted to get on live and tell people like y'all need to get out here. Like, what are y'all doing? Like, what what else is there to do but to sit by the water and drink coconuts? Like, hold on. It was just like truly an experience, and I was just sitting out there laying in the sun, girl, sunbathing all day. And then when you get tired of that, you jump in the water, you know. And it was just like, wow. But we didn't have a house, so we had to keep all of our food in a tent, um, and we had to cook on the this like grill um, that was like manually, you know, we had to manually light and stuff. And then, um, but during this time, it was very hard to cook and eat things, so we would order food from like this restaurant. <laughs> He was like, look, we going to be natural, but we going to order food from the restaurant down the block and just eat it outside. So we did that. Um, and yeah, so and then there's a lot of things that happened on this plot of land that were just very, very, very disturbing. Um, that's when he started like I feel like he started grooming me and um, using his wife to do it. Now, that was very, very like. Yeah, because I really thought like, and we, I think we definitely did have a genuine friendship from day one, but he saw that and he started exploiting that. He started taking pictures of me and her nude, you know, and, and it's just stuff like that was just like, I look back and I'm like, that was grooming, like he was grooming us. And, um, well, me, because I wasn't, I, well, I think both of us, because, yeah. She was young, and I don't think she really wanted to be with him <laughs> like that either. And, um, yeah, and during this time, I think, like, Osiris would just be, like, off playing with his toys. Um, Osiris had said something to me about how he, how he was unalived before. And so I thought he was speaking to me about a past life experience because that's what we believed in. And um, I brought it to Bishop and I'm like, yo, he's speaking to me about a past life experience. Like, it was just crazy. I felt like I felt like because I believed in what he was teaching, a lot of spiritual things were happening in my life at that time. I felt like I was seeing signs and I was hearing things and I felt like I was uh, tapped in. Like what people say when they feel like they're woke, like I feel like I was tapped in. <laughs> Like, I was, yeah, but it was really just, like, we ain't had nothing to do out there but make up stuff, okay? We ain't had nothing to do. Yeah, of course you're going to make up some stuff. I'm going to pull everything out. Um, And then, at that time, he was teaching stuff, Um, and, you know, Tron would sit right outside. Oh, I wasn't with Tron at this time. I wasn't with anybody. I was actually allowed to be by myself at this point Um, because I didn't get along with the other guy that I was placed with after Tron. So, yeah, I was allowed to be on myself. So that's why I say I felt so free and I felt so good to be there at this point in time. But I started noticing, yes, like Tron sitting outside his tent, listening to him talk. And we had to, like, listen to him all the time. And then he said, he, all like, uh, two or three, two of the guys left to go sell one of the cars. And the women that were there he uh, sat us down 
And he told us he felt like all of us belonged to him. And at that time, I was just listening. I'm just like, okay. I didn't really see myself with him, but I always, I don't know. I always thought he had some type of like foresight, like like, like he was able to tell the future. So I thought like, yeah, maybe I'm not into him now, but maybe he's right. Maybe one day I will be or something. So, yeah, um, but we ended up having to leave this land because it flooded. Um, one night we were in the tents and it flooded. So, yeah. <laughs> I remember we was all like in this little shack that was on that land. It's like a bathroom and we all had to just stand in there, watch the water rise above our feet. And just stand in there with all of our electronic equipment and just hope that the rain stopped. Yeah, that was, that was a lot. I don't even think I, you know, we even really processed that. But um, then we left and uh, it turns out like some people in the area noticed that we were in need and they, um, they were American and they allowed us to stay in their like guest house so we did and then we put our tents on that land (laughs) and it was like literally right down the street so it was like oh cool the only thing was we just couldn't be like toplets anymore um but at the time I'm still single but I started talking to this guy online and um I started you know getting more involved in the kitchen stuff because we had a kitchen now so I was mostly the cook and oh well helper to the cook and I was taking care of Osiris and at this time he's actually when he yelled at me about taking care of Osiris he was like you are Osiris's caretaker you should only be with Osiris (laughs) hold on Okay, so yeah, he's like, you have to take care of Osiris. That's your only job. That's all you do. And I'm not going to lie. I didn't like that job. Not because I I, I love Osiris, but I'm not Osiris' mother. Osiris wanted his mother. And so he was very... um, I think he was traumatized not having his mother there. And having these other women taking care of him like his mother like like I'm pretty sure like he just wanted his mother and so he would curse us out call us b-words and stuff and I didn't feel right disciplining Osiris I didn't feel I did not discipline him like they wanted he wanted me to tell him no you just if he acts up put him in the corner if he acts up just do this and I'm like I don't this is not my child you know like If you love him, if you love him, you'll do it. And I'm like, no, like, I'm not. So one thing I just never did is I was like, I'm not disciplined Osiris. Like, you can do that, but I'm not disciplining him. Um, I did not feel right about that. And when Osiris would yell at me or say anything negative to me, I did not yell back or anything because I didn't feel right doing that. And I saw that Osiris was really a sweet kid. And so it was just like, I I felt like I knew what was happening. I felt like I knew that he wanted his mother. But at the same time, I felt like he also, I also felt like he did want to be there with his father too. But his father didn't want nothing to do with him. And when it comes to like people like um, Aya and Efru and them saying like, oh yeah, he has kids and he loves his kids. He doesn't. He didn't care. Osiris was there for a few months and I never seen him really affectionate. Like the only time he'd be affectionate with Osiris was literally like for the camera or just to manipulate us to make it seem like he was affectionate with Osiris and loved his kids. I don't think he really cared because I was when I tell you I was with Osiris When I tell you I'm a stranger to this man and I just met this man a month ago and he got me watching his child, I could have been anybody. 
I could have been a predator. And he had me watching his child all of all day. All day. To the point this child comes to me for everything. So it's like, no, this man don't didn't he wanted the only reason why he wanted Osiris, he said he wanted Osiris there to so he can have his son. I want my son, I want my son. But he didn't want nothing to do with him while he was there. All of that was about control and manipulation towards Maisha, towards us, towards Osiris, everyone involved. And he didn't care about how that affected Osiris. And I tried my best to just make it normal for Osiris, painting with him, coloring with him, um, you know, just like try to make it normal. But then he wanted me to make content out of it. So I had to take pictures of me with us because he was like if you if you're gonna be here you have to make content too so it was like every time i made osiris breakfast i had to take pictures and video of it and put it on it like it was just like and i now i'm looking back like oh my god i wonder if his mom was seeing that like that is wild to put your child in that position to put your you know the mother of your child in that position um but, you know, I I did not speak up about it because I didn't I didn't know. I didn't know what what was really going on. I thought, like, I don't know. And I'm not. A, and, you know, the thing about it is, like I said, I could have been anybody around his child. But because I'm not because I don't harm children like. I didn't look, I didn't, at that time, I didn't look at it like it was weird. Like, why you got me watching your kid and you don't know me? I didn't look at it like that because I'm like, yeah, like I would never hurt a child. So he knows that. And he would always say like, I could see you're, you're a good person. I could see you're a, you're a real person. Like he would always say those things to me. So that validated that too. Like, okay, he, that's why he sees that I'm a good person. I wouldn't do nothing like that. But in reality, he don't know me. I could have been like him. <laughs> you know what I mean? I could have been conning him. So that's just weird. That's very weird to me. And it lets me know that he does not care about none of his and none of his children or children in general to put them in that position. But yeah. Um, that was mostly my role there. And um I really well, I really started to um kind of just like accept it and embrace it and love it because Osiris was, you know after a while warming up to me and just like knowing that I was going to be there, I was regular to him. Like I was, he knew I was going to be there for him. So we had a connection with each other. Like even when his mom ended up coming and getting him, I was very sad to see him go because I had spent a lot of time with him. But I know that being with his mom was the best thing for him. Um, but yeah, so um, he ended up leaving when we were in Cancun. When we were in this house in Belize that I'm talking about, we uh, this is the house that we moved from after we lived by the water. We ended up traveling to Belize a couple of times. This is the same house that Mama Dia arrived at too. And so there's like times um, and and Mocha came back, and this is the uh, times where we went to to uh, Mexico to Cancun. And just spent time out there and went to the beach and we would dance on the beach and he would bring the big speaker and we would like all the people on the beach would be watching us. And we were like, we were just like the performance. Okay? Like we would be dancing and having a good time. We would take all these pictures. Um, that's where you see that picture of us all in the water and Mama Dia is in there and stuff like that. Um, yeah, like there was a lot of good moments that we had um, during that time. And it felt really good to just not have to be in a relationship with anybody at that time. And I didn't feel like, you know, I mean, the, the, I think that some of us that other people that were single were like, you know, we felt like we could talk to each other and stuff. And I, I still talked to Tron and stuff. I still had conversations with people, but it was never awkward. It wasn't ever like, oh, we can't talk to the men or we can't go around. Like it was never. So it was weird when, um, Bishop started um making comments about me and the men like 
I remember I got dressed one day and he was like, oh, you trying to look cute for Key? Oh, you trying to look cute for Key? And I'm like, Key? I don't even like Key. Like, I'm not looking at Key. And he'd be like, oh, you got both. You got all the dudes here. You want to be with all. And I'm like, no, like, I'm just chilling. Like, he would start saying things. And I think he was, like, messing with me, but also messing with them, making it seem like I wanted them. or I don't even know what it was. It was just weird. And um, it's really like he would say that he didn't sexualize women or the body or he would go online and preach like, yeah, you had, you know, the technologies of the body, it's it, everything's there for a purpose not to be sexualized, but he would very much sexualize us in every way all of the time. And, you know, when we would take pictures, he would tell us how to pose, um, you know, and it, it was uncomfortable because I'm thinking I'm just getting, you know, I'm just being myself. I never looked at myself in certain ways until like Eligio started saying certain things about me, like talking about m my body in ways where, you know, making it seem like I just very, just sexualizing me. And I didn't ever really think of myself like that. And so I don't know. It was like, it was supposed to, me being there was supposed to be liberating and it was supposed to be freeing. And, but it started to feel like, I don't know how it felt. It felt like um, like there was more that I didn't know about myself. Like where I was supposed to be realizing more, it felt like there was now more I didn't know. And I guess that's really how cults work is it's like they say like we have the answers, come find out, but then you never find out. It's always like you're reaching it, you're reaching it, you're close, you're close, you're close, but you never really know. You never find out. Everything is just like in alluding to some truth that you never really grasp. So, yeah. And, um, yeah, just fast forward. Um, yeah, Mama D arrives. Um, we move into another house across the street from that one. <laughs> we live in every house in this village by now. And we're still like... Uh, using the bathroom outside and that's when authorities started getting involved and they would notice that and they told us like that's toxic to the environment and the people around us like y'all can't do that here um but yeah so and then this is at the same place where um, bishop actually prayed on me and coerced me into doing things i didn't want to do and then um later on I ended up getting back with Tron because I just felt safer with him and then we left Belize yes <laughs> hold up Okay, I'm back. Mm, technical difficulties. Was he intimidated by Tron? I don't know. I don't think so. Um, Tron was um like young. Like he was he was the same age as me at that time, I think. And we were both like kind of like we had a lot of naive naivety about us, like. I don't think he was intimidated by Tron. 
or any of us. Um, who's paying for these houses? Oh, oh, sorry, baby. I need to use the bathroom. Oh, uh, I see that. Here you go. Thank you. Um, who's paying for these houses? Who was paying for them houses? I don't know. <laughs> I don't even know. Not him. No, it was probably um key or um I think every time a new member would come and then also there was a lot of people who don't like no donated online who were fringe members. Hold on, hold on, what you trying to do? Oh, you plugging it in? Are you going to put hold on? Oh my gosh, Aaron, are you in here cutting up? The Cosmic Credit Union? Oh my gosh. <laughs> All I know is I didn't have no access to no money, never knew how much money we had. He would tell us when money would be coming in. Like, I remember Bambi was supposed to come when we was in Belize. And he was like, yeah, she got like $10,000. She got to donate to us and then we're going to build our houses. So he was always promising us like, the next money that we come into is what we're going to use to build something. But of course, something else would always come up. And so it was like that thing never got built <laughs> that we was going to use that money for. So, yeah. And then um, I think he had money coming in. I think um, members that would come join would bring all of their life savings, everything they had. Fringe members online would donate. He claimed he had his own um, money, residual income that was coming in, but I don't know how true that was because I didn't look into it. But when we were in Belize at the first place I was telling you guys about in Belize, there's videos online. You can look it up. But there, I guess he said that somebody went into his bank account and took all that money out. And he claimed it was his one of the former members, um, Pocahontas. But the thing was that the way I look at it is like, she probably took what was hers. <laughs> okay. But um, he said that she went into his account and took the money out. And then he started making these videos about cosmic currency and how if you trust in the universe and keep proclaiming the kingdom, you're going to get everything back. And then shortly after that, one of the members ended up getting this fat check to his account. And so we all looked at that. He looked at that as confirmation that, see, when you do God's work, things come in. So um, with the money, things like that would happen. And it was kind, it kind of felt like it was validating our beliefs, where it's like, okay, if we just keep going live and putting our frequency out there, we're going to get donations we're going to get money that just falls into our bank account and as you can see there's still some people who live like that um me personally i don't want to struggle on the struggle bus of com cosmic currency um i'm gonna get out here like what i was doing before and work for it and um, if i'm not offering a service a valuable one uh, one that's of value that people can you know appreciate then I'm gonna be broke. <laughs> oh, hold on. Huh? Oh, hold on.
Okay. I forgot where I was at, y'all, so I'm just going to read the comments. <laughs> I need some cosmic currency right now, she said. You better uh, cosmically put on your jacket and your shoes and go figure it out. <laughs> I'll be... um. I'd be darned if I've if I've ever felt that entitled again in my life to think that people owe me their money that they work for. But that's just a sidebar. Um Yeah, I'm I'm talking a lot, but I also want to say that um in between or in all of these locations, I think I talked a little bit about it when I was talking about how we lived by the water in Belize. These places were very beautiful and um, very attractive. And I think that's why especially a lot of women came because, um, and just people, young people in general, like coming from places like that don't have that type of scenery and just the air is different and um, you know a certain quality of food is different and stuff and I think that just coming from a different place is intriguing you and it makes you feel like you know this is something of value and then you have people to share it with that um ten that are that are really good people I feel like I met some really good people um, that everybody had their issues. Like I talked about mine with just having major issues emotionally and um, in myself, just having low self-esteem and like not no, just being lost. I think that thinking that this was going to fix me, thinking that he was going to fix me and thinking that this was going to save me and humanity, you know, it was very far-fetched. <laughs> and now it's like, I can see how, you know, I never really did the work because that right there, um, you know, leaving to go to seek that in search of that. And then I don't know. I just feel like you, you don't have you shouldn't have to sacrifice so much um, to. To have the meaningful life like yes life comes with sacrifices um and yeah you do have to sacrifice some things but i think that i thought like the exchange was equal um because it was like oh well i gave a little bit of my money and i get all of this in return but now i can see how just being controlled all the time like always having to um, obey these rules and stay within certain bounds just not even be able to go jump in the car and drive down the street or even go for a walk without checking in with this person or having to go with another member um, because that um, is something that that uh, cult leaders do as a tactic they never leave you can never be alone too long because you have they have to reinforce their doctrine and if you have too much time to yourself to think, then you won't, um, then you'll be able to peep the holes in the red flags that are present. And so I think that, you know, so much of my time, oh my God. Oh, okay. I thought I was on mute the whole time. I was about to be like, oh my God. Um, the whole time that, I thought I was getting so much, you know, and it was just like luxury living. <laughs> it's like within that were these this very manipulative and controlling things happening that, um, you know, I didn't, I, I feel like I was being very distracted by just the beauty and even the people there that weren't like Bishop, you know, it makes you think that like, 
there is community here. Um, and I didn't see, and initially I didn't see Bishop as much as I saw him later on. So um, during this time in Belize, he was mostly with his wife, grooming her, you know, and um, indoctrinating her. And he was he was really trying to um, get her pregnant. And I oh I forgot to mention that melanation in melanation he believed that the black woman was god you know the archetype and that when you are of a high frequency when you're god there's no need to procreate um by the time i joined the the teachings were different and i didn't know this because i didn't really look into much of melanation like that so by the time i joined he started preaching nation building um you know women are nurturers they're mothers and so we need to have children. And um, so uh, one of the meetings that I vividly remember was him asking all the women in the group, which was there was only three of us at the time, um, what do we want? What is our purpose in life? And um, I said, I went first and I said to be a mother. And then the next person went and they said, and I don't know why I said, I think I said that because that's something that I desperately wanted, but I felt like couldn't happen because of the state of my physical like body. Like, and like I said before, it wasn't, I didn't feel like it was, it was agreeing with me. I don't know what was going on, but um, yeah, like I wanted to be a mother and I felt like, is that ever going to be possible? And then so I think that's why I said that. And then the next person said they wanted to like grow food and trees and stuff. And then the other person said, just to be happy. And he went in on that person, like, to be happy? What does that even mean? <laughs> but he was then, he at the end, he was like, everybody should have had her answer. Um, and he was saying my, my answer, because that's the woman's purpose. So this is when he started preaching like, the women's purpose is to nurse, nurture, to have children, and to procreate so that, um, you know, we can build the nation and teach children the knowledge and then basically just create a new world, you know, and um, yes, exactly, Aaron, who gets mad at somebody that wants to be happy? I don't know. I think it was, but it, to me, it made sense at the time because he was saying like, that's so vague, like, what being brings you happiness you can't just say to be happy because it's that's not enough so it was like sometimes when he would yell on people i would be like oh i could see why he's trying to get them to think about that more you know like he the things he would yell at me about was like stuff i felt like one time he yelled at me really bad in Belize because me and um the cook were making a cookbook and he was like y'all been working on this cookbook for like three months <laughs> he was like when is this cookbook gonna be done like y'all not really doing it and, da, 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 da. and i remember i just cried because he was just like grilling us and he was like why are you crying you sensitive like you're super sensitive to criticism and da, 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 da. and then i went back and looked at my chart and of course in my birth chart it said you could be sensitive to criticism <laughs> so i ended up like going to him in his room and I told him, I was like, master teacher, I, I'm so, oh, I apologize, I'm so sorry. Well, we didn't say I'm sorry because of the uh, language that it, it, basically I'm sorry would be like subconsciously you're saying that you're a sorry person. So we didn't say that, we would say I apologize. So I said, I apologize, I shouldn't have cried. I really learned my lesson and like, I don't know, it was, it's crazy. It's like something in me felt like I needed to apologize to him for crying and getting emotional because I wanted him to know that like I took his teaching seriously and I took what his his criticism seriously and I was going to work on what he said needed to be worked on so it's very interesting how it's like it became this 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 like teacher student dynamic and this almost like father like this authority figure over me um yeah he became that in my life uh, very quickly. I think from day one, um, when I started watching him and his videos, I felt like he was an authority in a sense because he, I felt like he knew more than me. 
So I always put him on a pedestal. So yeah. Um, yeah, very, very interesting now looking back about that. But exactly, Ivy, that's exactly why he would, why we would say that. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Hold on. <laughs> Just funny. Oh man. Yeah, so yeah, like um Belize was interesting. Like it just it just showed me that like I I feel like I learned that um he was in charge. And not even so much like, like scared, like, oh my gosh, he's in charge. But like, he is the authority here because he knows the most. And he's been doing this before all of us. Like, you know, it's similar to what the women say now. He, he, was, he set out on this journey before any of us. And he had this knowledge before we did. And he was the, he, he knew it all. He seemed to have an answer for everything. Um, and he seemed to have everything under control. But, and at this point in time, I didn't see him being uh, physically abusive, but I know he, he probably was. Um, and I know he was definitely grooming me at that point in time. And he had actually just, I just know that he was, I think he was way, like building up for something like gaining my trust and stuff like that. Um, and then talking to other women in the group, like, like even talking to Mama D, like it was like very affirming, like reaffirming what he was saying because like everybody was agreeing. You have all these different age groups. I mean, the, you have the, the young, the younger people, but then you also have older people coming to join. You have people that are 10 years older than me, people that are 20 years older. Like you have people who are, you would think are more experienced in life and how, how are, you know, this, this has to be, this knowledge is attracting everybody. It looks like. And um, yeah, it just felt like, you know, every time, and then every time, you know, something negative would happen, like, um, not even negative. Anytime we would say something, like I remember one time it was said that like we first, we moved into this house and it was really dirty and we were complaining like, damn, we got to clean all this up. Like this is dirty. And he was like, y'all ain't never worked for nothing. Y'all might as well go back to Babylon because y'all not used to really working for some, oh, I can't stand y'all bougie ass. Like, and he, and it was just like, dang it. Everything that he did, um, to express how he felt about what we were doing in the moment it felt deserving in those moments because it was like damn maybe he's right like maybe we're being bougie or maybe we're being this or that like everything he said it was like it was supposed to be for you to reflect on it for yourself and he was never responsible for just being an asshole being rude you know or just being abusive so, yeah, we left there, and then that's it. Um, oh, before we leave, we leave there, he also felt was starting to feel like people were poisoning his food. And so he, he was really particular about who cooked for him. I did not cook for him at that point in time. He only had his close, people that he was close to. Uh, cook for him he was going he was on the fence of whether he could fully trust me or not or he was acting like it he was acting like it he went through my phone to see who I was communicating with he was looking at messages between me and my little sister like who is this 
he thought I was a mole, like, and I don't even know if he really thought these things or if he was just trying to see how far he could go with me and how, how much he, I would allow him to do. I don't know, but yeah. Um, and I really wanted to prove myself. I would cry when he did those things. I would cry because I, I wanted to, I wanted him to know that I was a loyal person. You know, I wasn't going to do nothing to harm nobody here. I'm not like that girl that called the FBI. You know, like I was trying to make a point, you know, like I'm not like these people that be out here, you know, doing those things to you. Like I'm not that type of person. I'm going to if I'm your friend, I'm going to be your friend. So, yeah, I was always trying to prove myself. So I just, you know, I, I, I mean, I did what. I, I really felt like I did a lot of what I was supposed to do. Like, I I cleaned, like, I cooked, I cleaned. <laughs> like, it was nobody's business. Like, I, it was just, yeah. To the point, I didn't really have time to do much else. But um, while we were in Belize, I had a little bit more free time than I would have later on in the cult. Like, I had um, time to paint. Um, he had got us, like, some recyclable paper or whatever, recycled paper. And I had paint, I would paint and I would spend time just like doing art. So we had a little bit more time. And he would come around that when I would do that. And he'd be like, look at you being dope again. You're so dope. And he would, you know, um, say it was just, it was weird. It was his relationship with all of us was very weird. It was definitely a trauma bond because he would, he would be, he would give us all this very positive reinforcement right after some really traumatic, just like abusive behavior. And I didn't really know. And I thought like this person really cares about us. And that's the reason why he's screaming on us. So when it started to escalate, I didn't really detect it because I'm thinking he still cares. Anyways, um, we weren't bowing to him at this time. We were calling him master teacher. We wasn't like doing no standing up when he comes in the room none of that um and this is around the time when we were more free to speak we could go on live when we wanted to we could talk to whoever we wanted to you know but he would say like you know talk to people who are on your frequency don't try to don't give cash or pearls to swine <laughs> which is probably a bible verse <laughs> don't give what is valuable to you to people who aren't going to be able to receive it so we would, you know, stay on the side. And it's crazy because the way the algorithm works on social media is when you start following him or any of us, you start seeing more people who are out here in Costa Rica, out there, you know, living in nature. And so most of the time you you kind of start to see the same posts over and over again in the same type of people. So anyways, we leave from there. We go to Cancun. That's when um, we meet Aaron and... When I first, and like I always say, cause I, I knew it off rip when I saw him, I was like, oh yeah, this is going to be, this is going to be bad because I'm supposed to be with Tron, but I know that's my husband. So this is going to be very, <laughs> it's going to be an awkward situation. Um, but I think like, as soon as we got to the place in Cancun, it was like, yeah, this is obvious. So there was a meeting and, you know, and Bishop would often do these meetings um, where uh, I actually think this might have been one of the first ones like this. But later on, he did it often where he would have everybody say who they're attracted to. Um, I don't know if he started with the men or women. I don't know. But I remember when Aaron said he was attracted to me, I was like, bet, because I was already thinking that. And um, he said he was attracted to one other person, too. But I was like, it don't matter. <laughs> and then, and then um, right after that, it was funny because right when I said I'm attracted to him, Tron scooted like three feet away from me. And I was just like, well, I'm sorry. I had to be honest. And then right after that, me and him, me and Aaron start talking. Um and yeah, just like trying to establish a relationship with each other, like just trying to get to know each other. And uh, when we were doing that, Bishop didn't like how close we were getting because we were kind of like secluded from the group just to talk to each other all the time. And he made it a point to say that 
we were like specifically Aaron was um uh, isolating himself and not a part of the group and he didn't you know he was trying to do his own thing he might as well leave and go do his own thing and Aaron was very talkative when he first came and while Bishop would be talking Aaron would start talking and be like yeah because da -da 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 -da. and we would all look at Aaron like bro we don't talk while you talking <laughs> and Aaron's like I don't know what's wrong with y'all like I'm cool like he was himself like a hundred percent and he was just like yeah because da -da -da. and then and then Bishop told him he was like look they don't talk while I'm talking you're not supposed to talk while I'm talking and Aaron's like oh that's how he, like you know you could tell he's something in him like switch because you know the group wasn't doing it either so he stopped doing it too but initially like he was very outspoken and he was like doing his own like he was really doing his own thing um and i even felt like this is nigga like i'm sorry let me excuse my language i'm like is he feeling me because he's like he's totally content by himself like <laughs> he's content um but yeah so and then um after that we oh this is when we start witnessing um some things happening with like him and his wife and it, it like he starts to get very verbally abusive and I think even physically abusive I can't really remember but I remember her wanting to leave and him not really allowing her to leave and this was all happening in front of uh, in front of probably majority of us and um he would always make it seem like she was in her demons and she was about to go back to her lower self so I looked at it like that too and um you know there was more additional members being added to the group like coming in at the same like a lot of people were coming in at this time people were being paired up like oh i like i kind of attracted that person i want to see what he's about i want to see what that person does. we had nothing else to do but to like get to know each other and the only way you could be like really get to know each other as being a female being a woman and a man like you can't really talk to each other unless you're in a relationship so at that point in time uh so you just kind of have to get together <laughs> like we're just gonna be together and we're gonna see if we like each other and so um initially it wasn't like oh we're being passed around um it was more so like eh, yeah like i want to get to know this person but in order to get to know them i have to like basically say I'm married to them and I'm their wife um for example the guy the one of the guys I was with I was with him for like a week or two and we really wasn't even that you know it wasn't even like we was just more so friends we would watch movies together and laugh but because we had to consider ourselves husband and wife to the public it looked like oh she's you know like but we was just kicking it like friends <laughs> You know what I mean? But it's like, you can't kick it with people. And I didn't realize that before. I thought it was going to be more friendly and more family-like. But um, I did understand that whole, like, oh, well, well, uh, you know, it's going to cause confusion if you're just talking to a guy every day, but then you say you don't want to be with them. Like, I, I, I got that part, so... And then I also felt like, you know, Bishop was more experienced with relationships. He would tell us about all these relationships he'd been in and all of the people he's met in his life and how he knows so much. So I trusted that, you know, he he knew more about like um, body language and everything than we did. But um, here you go playing with us again, playing with our playing in our face. Um, but. So we left we left uh Cancun and we ended up in Palenque and um that's when um Bishop first kind of started to get in between me and Aaron's relationship and other relationships there. Um we were at a hostel and in the hostel me and Aaron were asleep together in the same bed and I guess the guys there was some type of disruption something going on outside with another member and Aaron was asleep he didn't wake up to go do what they was doing and Bishop got upset like oh see you being with her is distracting you 
you know, relationships are a distraction, all this stuff. And he had this meeting with, with everyone, including myself. And he was like saying that I wasn't growing here. I had been here for, I don't know, maybe I had been there for about four or five months by then. And he was saying that I wasn't growing. So I was like, okay, I, I agree. I'm not growing. I think I'm going to leave because I don't want to be a destructive interference. Right. So I packed my bags. Um, and I was waiting to, you know, see who was going to take me where. And I didn't know. I, I figured I'd probably just call my family or something. to. And I, But I really wanted to stay in Mexico. But right when I had my bags packed and I was ready to go. And Aaron was out of the room and everybody was out of the room. Bishop looked at me and he's like, you really going to leave me? You going to leave me like that? And I was just like. In that moment, I felt like, you know, you're my friend. Like, I'm not going to leave you. Like, I don't want to leave you hanging like that. <laughs> and I put my bag down and um, I guess I just couldn't be with Aaron. That was the agreement. Um, but since I could, since I was by myself again, I, I decided to take the opportunity to apologize to Tron. Because I felt like the way that I went about, you know, like being in a relationship with him, but knowing that I liked Aaron was wrong. So I apologized to him and Bishop made a big deal of it, saying that I was in front of the whole group, saying that I was um, causing confusion here and that um, because I told Tron that I was sorry that I apologized to him at night. It was nighttime. I was playing with a man, like a man's urges and misleading him and all this stuff that I wasn't. That's not what I was thinking about. But he made it seem like you weren't consciously thinking about it, but you were subconsciously thinking about it. And so I was like, all right, whatever. And everybody was in it was agreeing with him. So I was like, fine, I'm just going to be by myself and do my thing. But Aaron wouldn't leave me alone, y'all. It's like, <laughs> No, he was just like, I don't know. I could just tell like I was not going to get over liking him and wanting to talk to him and stuff. And he would just be making jokes. And I just be like, bro, like, I don't know. There was something about him. But um, anyways, we end up moving to this house in Palenque where all of the crazy stuff happens, the wild stuff happens the freaking just yeah well anyways <laughs> i'm sorry just thinking about that i was like wow but we ended up moving to Palenque in that house where um it was like a jungle fruit jungle type place it was a lot of land we put our tents on there we were the first people to ever live in that house so it was very clean um that's what happened oh this was the first time I was ever like humiliated in front of the group humiliated in front of the group like and then punished oh my god like <laughs> so he first of all I told Aaron I'm like look I know you making jokes and doing all this but I really like you. So I could I would appreciate it if you respected that fact that I really like you. And he was just like, oh, you know, I don't remember what he said to me. But I felt like I had to tell him because he was making too many jokes. And I was like, look, we can play, but I ain't playing about one thing. And then um, it was somewhere around there where um, I... <sighs> I basically, I think Aaron, okay, so Bishop used to cut all of our hair, line us up and stuff. I think Aaron was talking to Bishop one day, getting his hair cut. I don't know what was said, but then Aaron was like, he came down the stairs and he was like, hey, he said we could be together. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and then I went to go get my hair cut. And then he was telling me like bishop was telling me something i don't remember what he was saying but i just remember i started getting an attitude like what are you talking about and he started saying like 
oh, you, you, that's how you, you gonna have an attitude with me? Da, 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 and he just started getting on me. And I'm like, bro, no, like, mm -mm, like, I don't like being yelled at. Remember, I was just about to leave. So I'm like, I am not about to sit here and take this. And then he was like, hey, yo, Aaron, come get your girl, basically. And he came upstairs or whatever. And he was like, nah, she got to go. The bishop was like, nah, she got to go. Because she just got an attitude. And it's crazy. And I was like, bet. So I went and got my bags again. Um, and I was literally like, fine. <laughs> and I don't know what happened, why I didn't actually leave. I remember sitting on the steps and everything. I was ready to go, but I don't remember why I didn't actually leave. I just remember like um, shortly after that, there was a meeting that Bishop um, orchestrated where it was us, me and Aaron asking the whole entire group what they thought, if, basically for their permission for us to be together. And during this meeting, the two other guys that I had previously been with started getting gassed by Bishop to say things like he was like, but she was just with y'all. How y'all feel about that? How y'all feel about the fact that she was just with y'all and, you know, y'all couldn't get none. <laughs> and now she want to be with him and she was with me and da, 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 da. and he put me in the hot seat. I literally had to sit in this rocking chair while he started asking me about my past asking me about men in my past and my relationships with men in front of the whole group. And then he just blatantly started calling me hoes and whores and all this stuff in front of everybody. And I don't know, that, that really broke, I feel like that really broke, broke me a bit for real. Like in that moment, I just remember just like feeling broken, like, and I believed him. So that was really what broke me because I believed his words. I believe that I was those things because of my past and because I had been with two other men there and because I had, you know, slept with him or I should say he coerced me because that's really what happened. And, um, you know, it was it was literally just that one time and I had never had sex with nobody else like nobody like in my life, clearly. And so I being called those things. It was like, I never thought I would ever be called those things. And it was like, it just devastated me. And their people was given their quote unquote honest opinions. I didn't think they was just, you know, saying what would look good to, to Bishop about what they felt about me and what they felt about me being with Aaron. So it was just like, it was like 15 people saying these things. It was just like, just humiliation what it was it was a humiliation ritual it was um a real negro moment before real negro moments became public that's what it was um he was doing those way before live you know he was humiliating us off camera way before he was humiliating us on camera so by the time it was on camera it was almost like i was used to it and uh people online were shocked but it wasn't really a shock to me. Um, I ended up basically being punished. And my punishment was that I had to sleep in a one-man tent, <laughs> which was like a coffin, in my opinion. Because you just have to, like, slip in there. And then you zip it up in this no room. Like, you can't lift your hands up. You can't sit up in it. And then I had to sleep in there. And um, there was bugs. It was crazy. It was stuff biting me. And the next day I was like, look, I went to Aaron. Because the punishment was that Aaron got to sleep in my tent, which was, a, I think, a four-man tent or a two-man tent, while I had to sleep in the one-man tent. So it was like he got, he got the good tent and I got the the punishment or whatever so I went to him and I was like hey I think you should talk to him about switching us back like or something like this is crazy <laughs> and um I was devastated man like I was crying everything because that was it was terrible to sleep in that tent 
But anyway, so fast forward, me and Aaron ended up getting back together anyways, and we sleep we sleeping together in the tent, <laughs> in the night tent. And yeah, so um and me and Aaron had a beautiful relationship um in Palenque uh, uh like for a while. And I think like it was very like I think we know, knew each other we had been together about three months before um I got pregnant. So and I I personally knew, you know, that the baby was Aaron's because I just knew that. But at that time, um, Bishop was playing with all of us, every single person in the group. He was playing with us. He had all of the women do a photo shoot. And he was like, y'all go back to that back room and y'all change, change into the, these clothes because we he wanted us all to wear one color. We went to the back room and changed. He knows we're all in the, in there changing. Bishop walks in the room as we're all changing. And mind you, each and every one of us is with another man. This is when he didn't, he only had one wife. So each and every one of us was with another man there. And he walks into the room. And he looks at us. And then he walks back out. And then he calls a meeting. And he's like, I don't know, you guys, I just got this feeling you know what I'm saying? I'm tapped into the universe and, you know, I got this feeling that I'm supposed to be with all of them. And everybody's just like, tell us more. <laughs> like, what? So we're just listening to him and he's talking and, you know, and, you know, he's charismatic and he's manipulative and he's saying things that are it's playing on our spiritual beliefs and stuff. And um some of the men agree that okay you can be with my wife some of the men say no i don't think that's okay for you to be with my wife and some of the women say yeah i would like he made it seem like for the women he talked to us like this he was like don't y'all want to have a close relationship with y'all's higher self well see i'm your higher self because i'm tapped into the knowledge i have this de direct connection to it so by you connecting to me physically you have a direct connection to this knowledge too so don't you want to be closer to your higher self some some women were like yeah like i would just like to spend more time with you like be able to talk and hang out and some women were like yeah i understand that like yeah that's cool like i think we should have a closer relationship you know so it was like he just made it seem like we needed this was for our spiritual growth basically to put it simply and shortly after that he called me up to his room and you know I talked about that in my testimony and stuff yeah so it was weird because it's like it put Aaron in a weird position it put me in a weird position and um he's he's somebody that we were supposed to put first because over this over this time in Palenque is when it started to get very structured and ordered. It stopped being about he's the master teacher and it started being about he's the chief. So if he's so he's the chief and he's our higher self, the um the commander in chief of the earth plane. So it was like, okay, when we walk when he walks in the room, we have to stand up with our hands behind our back. And somebody says, You're chief on deck. Like it's starting to get very militant. When we have a meeting, we have to stand at attention the entire time. Um, unless he tells us at ease, which is when we can sit down. But if he never says at ease, we never sit down. There's been times where people have passed out. There's been times where I have thrown up just, just standing there for so long. Um, you know, there was a time where I remember I got sick and I ran out at a meeting and I went to the bathroom and he came, Bishop came to the bathroom and Aaron came to the bathroom too. And um, Bishop was like, tell me what's wrong with you. Tell me what's going on with you. And he would just make it seem like, like he really cared. He was like, tell me what's going on inside. And I'm like, I don't know. I was like, I had this weird dream last night that, you know, I had a dream that Aaron was cheating on me basically. 
And he was like, so what that means is, <laughs> he, the bishop was like, what that means is like, you are starting to fall in love with him and you just want to know that he's going to protect your emotional investment. And I was like, wow, like that's profound. Like that makes sense. I do feel like I want to know that he, he knows that I'm falling for him and stuff, whatever. And so, you know, it was stuff like that. He would play little games and... But I, you know, I believed in him and I believe what he was saying. And I didn't think I was getting sick because I had to stand there for fucking, I mean, for freaking three hours or something. I thought I was getting sick because I had something I needed to express. That's what he would say. Like, if you're feeling sick, it's something wrong with you. If something's wrong, you know, like when Aaron first got there, his throat closed up and he couldn't even talk. And that's a major part of why me and Aaron broke up too is because he was telling me Bishop was telling me on the back end like hey yo damn he's acting weak yo he's acting weak and you know when you're sick you're supposed to be strong and you're supposed to you know come come up and come harder than that like you he was like do you ever see me sick I ain't never sick because sickness can't live in my body because I'm this I'm on a high vibration so I started side eye and Aaron like hey yo like you're not strong enough man for me. <laughs> and so, yeah, but really he was just, just freaking having some type of reaction to whatever was going on. And he needed, he needed support um, in time, but I was very impatient and I was very mean and cruel. And I was like, man, you acting weak, <laughs> you know, like you need to hurry up and like move past this. I'm like, master teacher. I mean, chief ain't never sick. Like, why are you sick? So, yeah, it was it was like stuff like that. And then Bishop, that's when Bishop started preaching that he had the best genes. And um, if you wanted to reproduce kids that have the best genes, you have to have his children um, and I remember actually saying to him, like, in a meeting in front of everybody, like, yeah, I think that you are the smartest person on the planet. And so, yeah, I probably do need to have your kids. Like, you know, like, saying in front of everybody, I remember that. Um, but just, like, me having that uh, connection to Aaron, I definitely just never felt like I could just fully let that go. And um, when I tried to, when I really tried to, I was with Bishop because he was like, okay, you're going to be with me. And I was really trying to like let go of Aaron. I couldn't even go downstairs like to where Aaron, I knew Aaron would be because I knew as soon as I saw him, I was going to like, I don't know. But so I would just stay upstairs or I would stay outside. I would just stay somewhere where I knew I would never run into him. And um Bishop would be like, y'all just, y'all just want to be together. Y'all just want to be together so bad. Like, y'all might as well be together. And then, but I'd be like, no, like, I don't want to be with him. Just because I'm, like, trying to, like, be with my higher self and show him, like, I'm committed to being with my higher self. And But he's like, no, you want to be with him. And one time he told me, he's like, you got to be with him or you got to leave. And I was just like, what the fuck? Because I felt like I was doing the wrong thing. Like, because even though he would tell everybody to be honest about how you feel, he still wants you to say what he wants you to say. So it was like, I felt so confused. I'm like, I want to be with Aaron, but yeah. being with Aaron is wrong. <laughs> so, <laughs> can you play with me, Emma? Oh my gosh, yes, I can. Can you hold on? Yes, I can. Oh my gosh, Ja wants to play. I'm gonna have to hurry up. So, um, yeah, I never knew exactly. I never knew which thing to say out loud. It's like, what do you want me to say, my guy? But at the same time, I, I'm trying to be right. I'm trying to be correct because the whole, you know carbonation it was all about being objective apparently we were always trying to what's the objective truth what should you do objectively well i'm like 
Well, objective it would be objective to have your children if you're the Messiah and you're the and you're God. You know, you're you're my higher self. It would be objective. But the thing is, the way I'm feeling is like I don't want to be with you. So he'd be like, "But well, you're supposed to go off of your objective um, facts rather than your subjective emotions." So that's what that whole back and forth thing was. But it was also him playing the game of when I was trying to be objective, quote unquote. He would be like, no, I think you should go back and be with him. And then it would be playing with Aaron because I'm telling Aaron like, or he's telling me to go be with Aaron. And I'm like, no. And Aaron's like, well, what the fuck? She don't want to be with me. Why? I don't want her to be with me then. Because Aaron is like, I don't want to be with nobody I don't want to be with. So it was very, everybody was freaking confused. Man. But then um, Bishop did something that was, it was strange. He took us all, all the women, to be with him, except for one of the other women that was pregnant. Right? Is that the girl? Yeah. When the other woman was pregnant, he took all the rest of us. It was four of us. And he he was like, I want to do this online. I want to do this thing online where I show people polygamy. We really wasn't living a polygamous lifestyle, but he wanted to showcase it like it was a polygamous lifestyle. So me and four other women had to like put on all this headdress garb and like go take pictures with him and you know then be on live with him in our bathing suits and like stand behind him and just basically act like yeah this is our husband and we love him but in reality <laughs> i think two of them really did like him and then the other two <laughs> me and one other um remember at that time we were like always together and like we just was like we would talk to each other and be like man we really don't want to be with him like let's just let's just like let's just stay out here all day and like not go up there because we didn't want to be around him and we didn't want to be with him because there was a lot of drama with him and his relationship like we just didn't want to be with him and be around him so we wanted to be around everyone else but when you're with him you can't be around everyone else. You have to like be up in the castle and like just sit there. And so I was like, no, like I want to go down and like see what the <laughs> see what the common folk are doing. <laughs> I'm one of them. <laughs> no, I'm being funny, but you know, I just want to be out and be about. So me and her was like, be out and be about, and then like try to sneak off, and he would come and find us, and he'd be like why y'all not upstairs with us? And we'd be like, oh, we're just out here, you know, writing poetry and stuff. He'd be like, BS, that's BS. Y'all trying to run from y'all selves and stuff. And uh, anyways, I just, around that time, I remember telling that girl, I was like, look, I feel like I'm pregnant and I feel like I know who the child's father is and it is not him and it's not Bishop. I was like, I need to get out of this relationship fast. <laughs> And so one day they're all in the tent and they're like, we're all in the tent with Bishop, all his so-called wives. And I started feeling like I just got sick to my stomach. Like they were all, you know, he wanted everybody to perform acts on him. And I was just sitting there like, no, I'm not touching you. Like, oh, like it was making me sick. And he was like, what's wrong with you? And I was like, I don't want to be here. I don't want to, I don't want to do this. And he was like, oh what word and I was like yeah no and he literally picked up the walkie talkie he was like hey yo come get your girl and talking to Aaron he's like hey yo come get your girl and Aaron came to the tent and I was like thank god <laughs> and we rode off into the sunset no I'm playing we left and you know then like that's around the time where I found out I was I was legit pregnant and um because I took a test and stuff and I was like I told Aaron and he was just looking at me like what that's crazy and then I told Bishop and I was like and this is exactly what I told him I said I just want to let you know I'm pregnant but I want but I want you to, I want to let you know that I know it's not yours so it's okay and he was like he looked at me and he was like no but it could be and I was like, what? He was like, no, but it might be mine. I'm like, no, it's not. And so, oh, God. 
then that's when he basically decided to humiliate me in front of the entire group um getting them on his side that i really didn't know who the child's father was and then uh, pulling up my pulling up a literal calendar on the projector screen telling everybody in that meeting basically the whole group when my ovulation was what days i had like it was just crazy just telling intimate details about me and my body to these folks basically saying he told he was saying that he has stronger swimmers than aaron because he's more melanated and all this stuff oh my god it was just humiliating i remember just looking out the window during this whole meeting and being like i'm gonna run the fuck out of here like i'm gonna get out of here like i can't be around this person i can't do this like this is too much like i can't believe this is happening like that is the last thing i thought was gonna happen when i told him i was pregnant like i thought everybody was gonna be happy for me but it turned into this whole humiliation thing and then then like i'm like well i want to be with aaron and then he decided to take it to the online streets and we had to go live and explain why i was with aaron and then we had to explain that i don't know who the child's father is and i'm going along with it but in my heart and everything in me is like i know who my baby daddy is <laughs> like, like i know who my child like and I did, obviously, you know, I didn't take a, a, any type of DNA test at that time, but I just felt like I knew. And it was just very frustrating and very humiliating for the world to know that. Um, because after that, um, I started getting a lot of messages, a lot of messages from people um, saying, like, calling me the same thing, calling me a hoe, calling me all these things and saying that, how could I be enlightened if I'm... If I don't even know who my baby for, how can I, you know, I'm not no teacher. I'm not no spiritual teacher. You don't know nothing. You're just a little this and a little that. And you out here giving, spreading your legs every, oh my gosh, like the worst stuff anybody could say about me. I felt like I was getting in my inbox and it was like, it was honestly, I think it broke me more. It broke me more. And the only person that I felt like I had that I could depend on was Aaron. Um, he he really didn't even care, um, or at least he ex he didn't express that he cared if the child was his or not. I think he cared, but because of what our relationship was like to the leader to be to Bishop, he didn't want to seem like he didn't care. I think I don't know. You have to ask him. But I was so sure every moment I got I would try to tell Aaron like it's your child like don't worry about this dude but me and Aaron would be sitting there having a moment to ourselves like minding our business and Bishop would be like but what if the baby's mine though it's like just walk up and say some stuff like that or whatever and he would just be like what the f is wrong with you <laughs> like get out of my like stop doing this and it was just awful like it was awful and I'm gonna pause right there because um, it gets worse and I just need a moment to, I'm going to read the comments. Um, the lie detector determined that was a lie. Yeah, exactly. It was definitely supposed to be a happy time for me. I don't think any of the women got to experience um happiness during their pregnancy for real like genuinely but I'll speak for myself and just say like I was super excited to be pregnant <laughs> like I was so excited one because my body works <laughs> and two because um I really wanted to have Aaron's child and I told him that and I wanted to do I wanted that and two I mean, three, because we that well, our beliefs were about nation building. And I thought like I was doing a service to humanity. Like I really felt that. And I really wanted to have many children like, you know, and so for the so-called kingdom of God, you know, so it was like a very happy moment for me. I was super excited. And then he took it all the way to H-E double hockey sticks with it. I was like, dang. 
he ain't even waste no time. As soon as I told him, he pulled, he called a meeting and pulled up the freaking calendar so quick. I just didn't even know how to feel. And, um, yeah, <laughs> but I, I can't express enough gratitude that it's not his child. So <laughs> that is like, um, thank you, God, the real God, or, you know, thank you. Like, <laughs> Lord have mercy. And I, yeah, I'm glad Jaw ja was healthy and made it too. Yes, yes, spam, spam knees. I think that's very important. Yeah. Um, Tyler asked, was y'all, um, I think I can like, oh, so you can like show the comment on the screen. Hey. Hey, okay, figured it out. Um, was y'all able to rest some days or every day was too much? We had we had days that were supposedly rest days. Sometimes he would just call it out on the walkie or he would come down um, and say, like, today's a rest day, y'all. But the thing, what it had became in Palenque was he started this thing where he was like, y'all, I think every morning we should have a meeting. And so every single morning he would come down. We had to be ready by like 7 a.m., be ready for the day. And he would do this meeting. And sometimes the meeting would last hours and hours and hours. And we would have to cook while he's talking or we would be too, like, stuck to cook. And we would just be sitting there for hours and hours and hours and then he'd be like all right y'all let's go start our day or he'll be or he'll he'll come down and be like okay y'all i think today's gonna be a rest day but then go on to talk for hours and so you think you about to get this whole day where you ain't gonna have to do nothing and you ain't gonna have to hear him talk and it would turn into a five-hour meeting like it was just that was it was crazy some days were genuinely felt like you just had more peace and you could do more stuff, but, um, yeah, but I think he liked to keep us busy a lot, so even if we weren't, um, even if we weren't, um, what do you call it, like, doing something for him directly, People would, uh, there would always be a production team working. People would be trying to get into their music and stuff. People who were on the go out team, they would be having to go out to get groceries and all this stuff. And we had to go do that once a week. Um, I myself was on the go out team as um, one of the women, what, because my husband was on the go out team, I was allowed to go. So all the rest of the women, you know, they had to stay at the on on, on the uh, land on the compound. I was allowed to leave, so I got to kind of like see parts of Mexico, see Palenque, see the you know the markets out there and all that, and see more. So I had a little bit more freedom in a sense, like especially when we would go on them uh, grocery trips, we would have fun, and we would always get us a snack. We would always be laughing, kiki in it up. Man, we would have fun on them grocery trips. We would take hours. I mean, we would take all day because we would just be having fun. Um, but yeah, so I'm trying to think of anything else before I go into. Um, oh, so the nudity came back at Mexico. So women were. Um, topless again men were always topless um, of course and we were always barefoot I, don't, I think I did not wear shoes unless I actually went out to grocery shop so um, I remember this is right this is before me being pregnant I remember um, he had me 
I mean, I, I was just walking around like topless like everyone else. But he pulled me aside and in front of all the men, I, like he gathered the men around and all the men were sitting in the dining room area. And I was standing like in the living room area with my chest out. And he asked the guys, who in, who in here looks at her, looks at her body? And men start raising their hands. And I'm just like, what is happening here? Like, I thought we were all naturalists and we were all like looking at each other, like not looking at each other, like sexualizing each other. So it was like, what is happening here? Like, why is he saying this? And why are they saying this? And then he was like, do y'all like the way her, like she looks and stuff? And it was just like, all the men were like agreeing. I don't, I feel like they were just agreeing with him because he was saying he liked it and they were agreeing, but it was like all of the men were saying it. And I was just like super uncomfortable. And um, basically it was in that moment <laughs> where he wanted to make, make a point that I had a certain type of body that I had to, I had to specifically me had to cover up at certain times. And it just made me uncomfortable because I'm like, so all these other women can kind of like walk around freely, but because I, I guess these men are attracted to me or you're attracted to me, I have to cover myself up when I came here to be free and to be liberated, you know, like it was just like, I don't know. It was definitely a weird feeling because I'm thinking these are all like my brothers or like just my fellow like tribe members like I didn't think they were looking at me no type of way and I don't think they really were I think they did look at me look at to me as like a sister or a lot of them say always said that I reminded them like an auntie figure but th I think the fact that they he was asking them in front and he, and he was saying like don't lie y'all don't don't lie y'all know y'all be looking at her like you know it made them want to raise their hands and stuff but then it just had became a rule where after a certain time of the day I had to cover up and then like all the women had to cover up. It was just like in that in that transition and just like wasn't it wasn't he was saying like we were supposed to be natural and not care about those things, but then he would say like, Oh, well, we got Babylon in us, so you know, it's in us, so we care about it. But I'm like, we're supposed to be breaking those curses and stuff. Um, obviously now I don't feel the way I do about nudity and stuff. I wouldn't walk around topless now anywhere, <laughs> but, um, I just pointed that out because I just thought that was very interesting and it's a moment that stuck out to me, um, while being there. Um, I think that the moments that you're kind of like berated in front of the group members are the most impactful sometimes in these groups because it just feels more it just feels more intense because it's multiple people and um you get to know these people and you build a you feel like you're building a meaningful relationship as a whole with the group and then it's like you you start to trust their their answers and stuff like that and their views Yeah, he would say, like, when it gets nighttime and the sun will go down, that's when men's animalistic nature comes out. And so women need to cover up so that they're not tempt, they don't tempt men. <sighs> yeah. So, and, and this is around the time in Mexico where he started preaching a lot about being a virtuous woman, being a submissive woman. He would do a lot of videos, a lot of lives where he would talk about how he likes his woman very small and for him to be able to intimidate and dominate um he would tell us women that that's what women like like women like to feel like they're almost being r-worded they like to be choked they like he would tell us what he was doing to his wife at that time that she was enjoying it and that they were both enjoying their relationship while it was also physically abusive that it was both in, it was enjoyable for both of them because she you know he would say like she's crazy and she loves that stuff and i'm crazy and i love it too and we just so passionate with each other and he would say all women really like that deep down and mind you i'm very 
um, inexperienced in myself and like also trusting this person. And I'm like, do I like that? <laughs> you know, like, well, maybe I do. I don't freaking know. Like, I don't know. But um, it just, like I said, it was a constant somebody telling you, him telling you about who you are and what you like and what is enjoyable for you, what makes you happy. At certain points, people was just like, no, this don't make me happy. Like he, he was like, I remember the day he was like, no, this don't make me happy no more. I'm, I don't want to be here because I'm not happy. And Eligio talked his head off for hours. Like, you don't want to be happy. You know, da, 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 da. like you, we don't come here to be happy. We come to bring change. We're the change in, in the world and all this stuff. And he is like, I don't care. I'm not happy. And I'm not about to stay here when I'm not happy no more. And it was just like, yeah, you could we could have moments together where we could enjoy each other, but he didn't like too much of like if it, we had to match his mood. If he was not in a happy mood, we could not be happy. If he was angry, we had to also feel that. Uh, so it was just like, it was, everything was about agreeing with him at the end of the day. And if, when you didn't, it was a problem. And, um, I'm trying to think of a moment when I maybe didn't agree with him. I would say there was a lot of other women there that disagree with him at that time and that were pushing back on things that he was saying. And I would often like speak up for him and speak up against them. Uh, so I wasn't really one of those people that would talk, like, like give him attitude and stuff. Um, and like I said, I would try to avoid him, you know, stay, stay, with down with the comic folk okay like you can stay down here with the comic book because i just feel like I, I i like the vibes better i think that's why a lot of people who came to carbonation and they say they had a good experience is because they weren't really around him that much they were around the group uh more so um when you start getting around him more then you start to see things like he trusted me sometimes he would just want my opinion on things and I would have to sit in on certain meetings and stuff like I was a council like I was a part of a council or something and um I guess he wanted to make me feel important um but it also allowed me to see certain things that he would do to people um I saw him putting his hands on his women and stuff uh, like the women closest to him um, I saw the way he manipulated came in between what people really wanted when somebody would come to want to be with a certain guy he would be like no I don't know about that I you know you stay away from him you don't need to be around him right now you need to work on yourself you know and, or he'll be like yeah okay you'll be with him but I bet you in a month or two you'll be looking at me you know I I was but by that time that I was seeing all that stuff I agreed with him like everything he was saying that would come out of his mouth it did not matter I agree with everything and oh, scary because that's the same way those three women that are still in his life that's the way they view him he can't do no wrong he can't say nothing and no he will never be held accountable by them because everything that he says out his mouth and now his butt is gold and it's it's very very sad um he had more defining roles for women you know like women need to be in the kitchen they need to cook and clean and serve their men um i would do videos with other women that showcase this to make to put that message out like this is what women are supposed to be and the whole justification was women in the system are being masculine. And, you know, if y'all been following, y'all know he, that was the whole rhetoric. Women are being masculine. They're out of their feminine energy. We need to get more in tune with it, blah, blah, blah. But really, um, we never spoke. It was like uh, women don't speak. Um, they're to be seen, not heard. If they do speak, they suggest things. They don't try to change their man and they don't try to tell their man what to do or what decision to make so basically you just do what your man says which then leads to assault and um you know coercion and very bad and triggering things so <sighs> yeah 
Um, but yeah, there were some beautiful moments in Mexico. It's so hard because it's like you can see the trauma bond. Because what I'm saying, I'm like, this is what was going on. But then it was so beautiful. Like, you know, so it's um that's why I told the women and they when they uh the the current women that are still there, I told them, well, I, I commented on their video. I'm like, y'all can post all these good moments, but we're not debating about that. We know there's good moments. The issue is we didn't speak about the things that were done behind closed doors and on camera that we simply justified with, oh, we deserved it. We were in our demons. We were fighting our generational curses. He's our higher self, so it's okay. It's never okay. And I want to show you guys something that I think is just very important to see. I think it's very important to see. Let's see if I can do it. How do I do that? Let me see. And because I don't want to be, I don't want this to take forever. Let's see if I can do this. What? Oh, sorry. Don't, don't mind me. Um, share my screen. Screen sharing. Oh. You know what? Oh, hold on, y'all. Okay, so yeah, um, I'm sharing this. Let me know, let me look at the chat. Everybody could see it. So, when women were being, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of you guys know this, but when women were being um, what he would call disrespectful, which is just you could simply have an attitude, not want to do something that he's telling you to do, um, or just simply <laughs> do nothing, literally, and he just have an issue with you. Um, he started implementing. Now, at first in Mexico, it was just, it was squats. We had to do a lot of squats. And when I was pregnant, I had to do squats too. It didn't matter. Um, and then I uh, ended up escalating into um, standing in the corner. But like I was telling you guys earlier with, with uh, Osiris in Belize, he was already telling us to put, he was telling us to put Osiris in the corner. I never thought he would have had us in the corner but I think this is where it kind of started at 
I think, was at Mama Cookie's house. This is where that this picture is taken. And this is, it ended up actually being a little different from this, like how her hands are. We actually had to, if we, whoever was standing in the corner, they actually had to put their hands to their sides. You couldn't touch nothing. You couldn't fiddle with your hands. You had to stand there with your hands to your sides. And then eventually it escalated to, I think, um, Malia was the first person who had to stand with no clothes on. Um hands to your sides and you just have to look at the corner of the wall until and for three hours so somebody would time it um or you would put it, your phone timer on three hours and you just stand there um me personally i never stood in the corner for three hours but i have st stood in the corner um while having to listen to shahazad ali in the background because i was apparently being a disrespectful woman and then um, I also got put in the corner one time. <laughs> I got put in the corner. <laughs> I got told to go to the, to the corner when I was, I think I was talking back to Bishop. I didn't agree with things he was saying. Or, you know, I was looking at him crazy. Like, what are you talking about? And he was like, are you for real right now? Go stand in the corner. But like literally like five minutes later, he called a meeting. So I didn't have to stand in the corner. But I know some people literally had to stand in the corner for three hours. No clothes on. I've even had to. Um, I was even told to actually give this punishment out to people. And it's humiliating. It's humiliating. Like. This is what we did to women when um, we had the boot camp. Made them get in corners if they, if we felt like they needed discipline. So I wanted to show y'all that because there might be some people who never seen this or they didn't know about a lot about carbonation or bishop or what type of things he had is doing. This is clear evidence, and he actually probably was the one to put this on live because he's just so boastful. That he had, who was that? Efru, that's Efru. Because she has that tattoo in the middle of her back and she had those thing, sticks in her hair. Um, he had Efru in the corner. And Efru's still there to this day. And the other person in this picture looks like it's either Aya. It looks like it's probably Aya. She like, shit, as long as it ain't me. <laughs> and that's literally how it would be too. Um, but yeah, I wanted to show that um, why he had Malia laying on the floor. Oh, did I show that? Hold on, let me show that to you too. I might as well. I might as well show that to you too while I'm while I'm here showing the uh, sharing the screen. Let me see. This is very triggering, y'all. Before just before it pops up, I'm gonna let y'all know this is a very triggering photo. Um I never saw this live, y'all. I don't know. Um, I don't. I don't know what was going on in the whole live. I think he was supposed. I think they was supposedly dancing at one point. I think, and then he started proving that he was dominant over her, seeing how far he could go, and he went that far. And this is how he feels about women. This is how he feels about women in carbonation and women in general i think it's just the women in carbonation that he was allowed to do it to for real to this extent but this is how he feels about women that's malia on the ground which we know who malia is malia is tanisha if you don't know who malia is or who tanisha is malia uh tanisha is her real name and she's the one who sits in the middle in all of their videos 
And she's the one that they were calling Queen and his main wife. Um, and this is her at one point at Mama Cookie's house, which is when, in Atlanta um, around COVID time. And this is him putting his foot on her head. And he, I'm pretty sure he made her put go into that position and whatever other positions he wanted her to be in. And he put his foot on her head to show his dominance, to prove his dominance over her. This is how he feels about women. This is how women were treated. Um, especially when you are like one of his close wives. This is how you're treated. I wish, wish, wish I had more um, things of like things that y'all haven't seen because <laughs> I would show that too. Um, I mean, it's not funny, but it's like, I feel like I wanted to be exposed. Like even for those women's sake, because I, I witnessed a time where he beat Kayla to a pulp. He beat her down just for making a face and beat her down and then after he was done had us all surround her to intimidate her and I know she remembers that I know all three of them remember being abused by him but I think they're trauma bonded to him and the positive reinforcement is pretty strong um, because I think I said it in my um, impact statement it's like you want to believe that can't nobody be this bad he is not this bad like but that's the thing he definitely and completely is And, and then he would involve every member of the group in it. So then everyone else kind of becomes trauma bonded too. Because in one moment, we're all laughing and smiling together. There's one video where we all surround Malia. Some of y'all might have seen it. We're in the bathroom. And we're all surrounding Malia. As you know, you know, I even have an apron on like I just came from the kitchen because he called us up there. He's like, y'all, she's being a cancer cell because that's what what he would say. Like if this person's being a cancer cell, we need to surround them. We would all surround her and the women would go first and be around her. And then the women, I mean, the men would be right around us and right in the middle of of us like intimidating her and him saying all these negative things about her yeah yeah <laughs> yes cancer cell or a virus and then um so right in the middle of us, like him intimidating her, us all intimidating her, he he's like, oh, y'all, we just playing. And everybody starts laughing. What? But he wasn't playing. He was very serious. And it was like, we all just started laughing and hugging her. Crazy. And um, even after we saw Tanisha, uh, you know, be whipped with the leather belt. Um, right that night he had us run her a bath and or maybe I don't know who ran her a bath maybe he did and um, he had us come in the bathroom and we all hugged her and she cried in our arms and we just hugged her and told her how strong she was and like it's just like stuff like that I feel like it's a, it, it, it's making it very hard for them to break ties with each other because they've just been intertwined in, in their pain um, with each other. I know for, for a fact, you know, it was hard for me. And even, 
even now, I think everybody's relationships, I don't know. I feel like it, it, it has affected them. It has affected our relationships with each other. And it's really sad because I think in another time, in another space, it wouldn't have been like that. We would have been able to have had good relationships with each other. Um, I think they probably would have gotten along. Like, who knows? Who knows? But that environment and him, him being constantly causing this war between everyone, saying one thing to one group of people and another thing to the next, it just, you know... You're at constant battle with everything and everyone except him, the real, the one you're really supposed to be battling with. So, um, so no one tried to stop him. Um, I don't even think people knew exactly what he was doing as far as like stop him from abusing someone. I can't remember a time when anybody really did anything impactful to stop it. And I think that's just because you know, you don't know how far somebody else is willing to go to stop you. I witnessed <laughs> I witnessed um, something very tragic. It was a uh, one girl. I think her, I think she came out and talked about it. Her name was Isis. Um, she she said something to us. That it was during the women's boot camp in Puerto Rico. She was like, "I uh, I'm having thoughts about grabbing the knives in the kitchen and and doing something to y'all." And we was looking at each other like, "What?" And when me and Efru and Zoka went and got on the phone with with Bishop, who was in Atlanta at the time with Aya and, and Malia, and we like, man, this girl up in here talking about she thinking about grabbing the knives. And he was like, Y'all gonna let somebody talk like that, talk to you like that in your house? He was like, Nah, man, I would have whipped her butt. He calls all of us, all the women in the room. Um, while he's on FaceTime, he's on the phone and he calls this meeting and he's like, y'all let her talk to you like that. I would have stomped on her. You know? I would have beat her. And before he can get all his words out, boom, somebody just stole on her. I think it was Efru. Efru just stole. Boom. And then it was another person then another person. And everybody just start hitting her. Mind you, these are people who literally have only been, some of them have only been there for a few months, maybe even less than that. But they all just start hitting her too. And then he's like, no, nah, man, take that stuff outside. Don't do that inside my house. Somebody pushes her out the door. She goes off running, running. And we catch up to her, all of us. Every last woman catches up to her. And every last woman, I, I think, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, we all put a hand on her. And a foot and a somebody probably spit on her and everything. It was terrible. It was great ripped her clothes i mean it was just terrible i mean granted i don't think we was very strong but still no you don't put your hands your feet your nothing on nobody like that that was crazy that was wild and these people you would think like somebody would have stopped that right because it's like wait no we don't i ain't never been in nothing like but because everybody was doing it and i think at one point it was it's like you better get your hits in for your next. It was like crazy, and he was on the phone the whole time, like get her, get her, get like crazy. So I don't think I think we was more so going at each other than we was going at him, because that's the way he had kind of set it up. Like he has set it up like that. He in his world, he was helping us and everybody else had demons he was cleared and healed of his demons everybody else had demons and we and now we had to fight 
our own demons and the demons in each other, basically. That's how it had became. So, you know, he stood, he stood far and wide from a fight. Far. And that's what it is right there. Um, she said it. She said it. It's very triggering. And I pray for that girl. And I, I apologize to Isis. I think that was a terrible thing that happened to you. Terrible that I was a part of it. Um, I wish that didn't happen to you. And I hope that like you have had some healing um, when it comes to that. Because like you did not deserve that. That was not right. And then after that we put you in a room and locked you in there until you found a way to get home. Like that was crazy. That was like I, I really do apologize to you. Like that was just, I know for a fact, none of us was in our right mind. And we, I don't think if we were in our right mind, we would have done that to you. And um, yeah, that's very sad. That's just, just terrible, bro. Yeah, certain women had became his, um, he would call them his warriors. And it was Efru and Zelda for the most part. Hold on. Oh, the sound went out? No, nah, man, I had to go um, take care of my child. <laughs> um, <laughs> man. Yeah, he called them. They wore his... Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Yeah, man, he called them they warriors. He was like, yeah, y'all need to protect me because I'm the prize. Basically, like, he's the deity. He's the prize. He's the God. We need to protect him like we would protect God. But if you don't. Ooh. Blog lurker. Exactly. And what's so funny about that to me is that when I'm not doing nothing and I be trying to do stuff and I be in his face, he'd be like, mom. But then the moment I'm doing something, you want to be like, mom, like what? Crazy. But it's OK. Ooh, that's a good point, because somebody because somebody said 
Can you tell how Bambi left? Somebody said Bambi is still in. She's still mentally with it. Exactly. She never really left. Bambi left, though, um, at Mama Cookie's house because she was given an ultimatum. Her daughter was sick in the hospital. She was given an ultimatum to go be with her daughter or never come back. I mean, go be with her daughter and never come back or stay. So she was never welcome back because she um, went to go be with her daughter while her daughter was in the hospital. So she, I think she made a good decision on that part, but um, unfortunately she still uh, miss being misled. So that's unfortunate. And, uh, but back to, I want to rewind um, because I told y'all I had a little space from that. So <laughs> let me just say this. No woman, because I'm going back to when I was talking about um, my pregnancy, no woman was taken care of during her pregnancy in carbonation. I don't care what anybody tells you. I don't care if, if Zoka said it out of her mouth herself. She was not taken care of while she was pregnant. None of the women were properly taken care of while they were pregnant at all. Grant, okay, I get it though. There's this other side to it where we believed in this natural lifestyle. And so we did want to have children naturally. But we were not eating healthy. We were not being treated. Uh, we were not in healthy relationships with this person with Bishop, we were not being treated right at all. Um, there was one point in my pregnancy because we ended up getting kicked out of Mexico. I'm sorry, we didn't get kicked out of Mexico. We left Mexico because they, um, there was reports that we were being trafficked. The women were being trafficked. So the police came with guns took all of our electronics to investigate the matter. Um, they interviewed the women only, I think they only interviewed us. They asked us if we had any tattoos because they wanted to see if we were being trafficked. They asked us if we wanted to be there and stuff. And we told them yes. And um, they sent us home after a very long, 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 long night at the police station. And when they sent us home, the next day, Bishop woke up and he was like, we got to go, y'all. We can't stay here no more because now they looking at us. They trying to, you know, he's just so scary. And I think I was about five months, six months pregnant. Maybe I was about five. I was, I was, yeah, I was up there. And I was probably six months pregnant, honestly. I was like, What? We're about to leave because this is how he is. He's like, oh, we about to leave. Pack up. Let's go. As if like we had create, we have been in Palenque for a minute um, for that rest of 2018 and all and I mean, for the whole 2018, I think almost we have been there and it was like had became our home. We had all these things. Um, Bishop had bought me and. He had bought all of the members things with other people's money, somebody else's money. Somebody else had a check and he went to Walmart and splurged and he came back with stuff for everybody. We came back with speakers, all this stuff. We had to leave all that stuff there. And he's like, all right, let's go get in the van. Let's go. I remember I was six months pregnant. I was just like, I don't want to go. And he was like, well, you could stay your ass here. Then that's what he said. It's exactly what he said. And I was just like, Y'all ain't about to leave me in Mexico. Like, that's crazy. So, of course, I got myself dressed and got in the van with everybody else. It was the most horrifying trip ever because we were pinching every penny. So, we didn't get to stop for food like that. Um, I remember, like, eating nuts for the most part, chewing on ice because I was so hot. And one, I remember one time he got the women, he said, I'm going to get the pregnant women some food. He got us some fries. Me and the other women, the other woman who was breastfeeding. And then there was, yeah, 
it might have been another woman that I was pregnant to, but I was the most farthest along. So, yeah. The whole time we was traveling from Mexico to Nicaragua, I didn't really eat like that. I was very malnourished. Um, and I didn't know the health of my baby. And, um, you know, it was hard. I remember being one time, because we had to sleep. We didn't sleep. We had to sleep either in tents on hard concrete, which I was just like, what? <laughs> no. Or sleep in the van. So I opted to sleep in the van. But it was so uncomfortable. I remember one time trying to sleep in the van, and I just felt like crying. Like, man, it was just, it was just very uncomfortable the whole ride. You know, obviously with a big belly and stuff and the baby and just just crazy. Um man. And I think that as a woman there, you can't show your weakness. So I just tried to make it seem like I was cool. Like I could survive off nuts. Yeah. Like give me some more ice i'll be straight like you know like i just had i just wanted to seem like i was a warrior i could handle anything because everything was mental right no but that's how i wanted to make it seem that's how i wanted to you know so yeah and i and like it was so sad that even when he did get us fries the other members were hungry too. So you feel bad eating in front of everybody. And they're looking at it like, can I just get one fry? You know, and it's like, dang, yeah. Like, I don't want you out here just like looking at me eat. But I am pregnant. And it's just like, it just puts you in a really, really weird position. And you make, make you just want to go eat in a corner somewhere. Or like, you know, like it just, it's, yeah. And I know you know, there might be another perspective of like, well, at that point, why didn't y'all just go? Like, for me, I, like I said, I was trying to stay strong. Um, as a pregnant woman, um, I believed at that point in time that you were supposed to keep your child um, around the child's father. Like, I didn't want a broken home, you know, like that type of thing. It was that whole teachings about you know he would always say like black women need to be held accountable they need to stop taking these men's children and going off to be single mothers and that whole thing he had been preaching a lot about that since Costa Rica he even had the women in Costa Rica saying addressing other women black women saying black women we need to be righteous we need to do this and we need to do that he always had the women addressing what women should be like and what women should be doing so that we could basically just model ourselves after what he thought women should be doing so yes I was like let me just stay here stick it out my child needs his father um you know I need a man I can't be out here on my own we get to Nicaragua and um you know he gets arrested he goes to what no he didn't get arrested yet. We get to Nicaragua. We get to this house where, oh yeah, um, uh, Tori was paying the bills. She was paying the bills at that place. Um, and we was over there, and we were there, and I, that's when I, I realized the ba I didn't know how far along I was. I was using an app. When we were at the house, I realized I'm probably going to have this baby soon. So he allowed me to go to the hospital. He took me to the hospital, me and Aaron. And um, we got the baby finally checked and stuff. And they told me that my, you know, my vitals weren't, some of my vitals were low and stuff. and Or not, you know, not up to par and stuff like that. They told me I was going to have to have a, a cesarean. And um, I cried about that. And Bishop is like, why are you crying in front of these people? You showing weakness and da, 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 da. And I'm just like, damn, like, 
okay, like I'm trying to suck it up. Um, you know, I was very happy though to find out that I was having a boy because I knew I was having a boy. I always wanted to have a boy. So I was super excited about that. But, um, and at that time it felt like Bishop had kind of accepted that Aaron was my child's father. Like he was, he stopped harassing me about it so much. So I was just like, okay, cool. And, um, yeah, so yeah, I think I was very malnourished and, um, yeah, I think I need, I should have, I probably need to be checked into that hospital at that very moment. But we went back to the house and then my water ended up breaking just a few days later. And, um, yeah, we went to the hospital and this is when he put me on the live to tell the quote unquote world that I needed money to have a cesarean and it was just very sad it was just very sad because like um I'm like me looking back on it it's very sad because I feel like in my in my real life like who I am now I would never ask people to support me in a child that I you know that I have that I'm having that I that I created you know like I would never ask nobody to say I would never be like can y'all send money to my PayPal and I bet people actually did send money but on the record that money wasn't used for me if you sent money or if you know somebody I don't know or just to let people know that this is how Bishop operates. This is how cult leaders are. Like that money was not used for me. If any money was sent, I didn't see that money. The money wasn't used for my child. Who's <laughs> right here? What's <laughs> ja is so handsome oh my gosh so yeah so yeah, yeah yeah i just wanted to let that be known too i don't think i've ever told uh the story of um what it was like uh at, you know beyond that moment of just me being pregnant but um and and me being in that position that basically it was like well, you got to So basically it was like, you got to have a cesarean and here at this hospital this is how much it costs. And I was in full blown labor and we didn't, we, we couldn't afford it. So <laughs> mind you, in re, in the real world, in reality, this is why I say I don't do the cosmic currency BS spiritual one, because clearly that's from the cult um, programming and all that mumbo jumbo that I just really don't agree with at this point but also because when it's time to handle business and you don't have you know what I'm saying you're not you don't have what you need that's nobody else's responsibility but yours you know so I see that now and I'm like if if that were in the real world I would have never needed I wouldn't even have like why am I going to the internet to talk about that like no not at all and I also think that it's just like 
I just think that it's like I I would plan ahead of time. Like I'm I'm obviously the child told you he was gonna be here in nine months. Just plan for your child and save your money. That you know, obviously living in that type of lifestyle is like you're just flying by the night. Like you're just I don't even know if that's the saying, but you're um hoping and wishing on a scam or on a on a you know on a star. But it's like, no, you need to plan for this child. You need to know what's going to happen. And this is why each and every pregnancy that uh, of the women that that each and every baby that was um, supposed to be born, I'll say that because there was a child that didn't make it. Every baby that was being born or supposed to be born, it was all just like last minute, like, oh, my gosh, take them to the hospital. Every single one. We were supposed to be natural living. Da, da, da. No, take him to the hospital. I don't, I don't know what to do. This man's talking about, I delivered my son. I know what to do. No, just go to the hospital. I don't know what to do. But then you don't have the hospital funds. So anyways, um, that's, you know, I shouldn't have been following behind somebody trusting their word, obviously, without doing my research on this person and knowing who this person really is. But that's besides the point. Um, we, um, me and Aaron ended up, actually that hospital ended up putting me in an ambulance and taking me to a place that I could have my baby, uh, free of charge, which I'm so glad existed <laughs> in Nicaragua. Um, it wasn't, it was, I don't think it was licensed doctors though. Um, but they were students of doctors, I believe. And, yeah, I had a whole entire cesarean there. And I honestly, the moment that I was on the table and they were putting the shot in me, I was like, I'm probably going to die here in Nicaragua and nobody's going to know. And, you know, I just like, I I kind of made peace with that in that moment. And when I didn't, <laughs> you know, pass away, I was like, well, dang, like, shoot like okay I made it through that but I had kind of like yeah I remember that feeling of laying down after they shot me with whatever it was I was like okay if I if I pass away here I remember actually thinking like I can't die because that was the teachings I was like well if I die I can't die you know <sighs> which reminds me that I never talked about Mama Dia but I think that, um, I don't know. I, I think that that's, it's been said a lot. I mean, I think there's a lot of assumptions about it, but the reality is that, um, when it, when it came to the doctors and medicine and all that Bishop was against it and he felt it was Babylon and, um, it was something that people knew before jo joining and also while they were there that we did not subscribe to it um especially you know during that time but of course later it changed and of course I'm actually having my baby at a hospital and other women are too so it's obviously not the beliefs um uh, in totality but yes we didn't believe in taking medicine or anything like that so um, Mama Dia didn't take her medicine. I'm not sure. I'm, obviously, she was coerced to doing so because of what Bishop was preaching. And she had a heart attack in her sleep in her tent. And um, that's where we found her in her tent. And um, yeah, we took her to the coroner because we tried to take her to the hospital. And there was like a whole rally going on in the street and we couldn't even like the car, the cars were just stacked up against each other lined up. But the ambulance got finally got to us and then they pronounced her, you know, deceased and they told us to take her to the coroner. And so we did. And they determined it was a, a heart failure, a heart attack, I believe, like, um, but yeah, so that's what happened with mom. I mean, I know a lot of people might already know that, but I know they're it's still a very sad situation, unfortunate, because um I don't think I think somebody asked me that question. Do I think that um 
if she had never came, would that have happened? I don't, I don't know, but I know that she was taking her heart medication for years and she didn't like the way she told us that she didn't like the way it made her feel, but it will, I think it might've been keeping her alive. Well, we can assume that if she had this heart condition for over 10 years and she was still living. Um, but yeah, but I also think that, um, Mamadia was a believer like any like all of us. She definitely believed that um Bishop was the Christ, the return of the Christ. And she she was like I think she, she was really one of us, like as far as the a cult member in that incarnation. Like she believed in it. And so it's unfortunate that everyone believed in it. To the to the point of how because it's so destructive and it and it is, um, but yeah, I think all of us has suffered in many ways, and that's one way that I think like after leaving and, and leaving mentally is when I finally processed and grieved that because I never got to really grieve her in that whole situation. Um, but I ended up actually being able to do that, which was very like, I don't know, it was just like, it was, I don't know what to call it. I don't want to call it good, but it was, I was glad to finally be able to like address real feelings about that, you know, like that, no, this person didn't just like pass on into another realm and where she's now in her higher self, like, no, she she like was tricked and conned out of her life like and it was it's sad so I think we were all in that space of like you can't you know you can't die everybody you know energy doesn't die and all this stuff and everybody just keeps going and uh, but it's like and the reality is that she passed you know so um but yeah definitely a sad thing for her family um people that know her and love her you know truly because I think that every one of us had people support that people who really loved and loved us for who we are truly but you know um unfortunately we uh we believed in in that lie so much that we distance ourselves from those people so um i think i have spoke on what happened to the baby as well before um, I think I'm also going to let um, Zoka tell her story one day. Only she knows how she feels. You know? Mom, come on. Come on. <laughs> no, not to laugh. <laughs> jaw literally jumped on me that's why i was laughing like that oh my goodness ah i tried not to be on here that long and then i started going into really really vivid details instead of just giving the gist of what happened that's what i meant to do y'all i had notes and i didn't follow them so yeah excuse me i'm like this was really not supposed to be that long <sighs> Yeah, I know. Zoka still hasn't grieved that. It's really sorry. It's really sad. But yeah, I do. I do want her to tell her own story because um, I saw a video of her the other day of when she was pregnant and she was like big, you know, about to pop. And I was just like, oh, my God, like, I don't know how it feels to be in that situation. And it's, you know, I don't because, you know. 
I, I didn't, I wasn't there, you know, in that hospital with her. And also I didn't experience what she experienced, but I know her, her emotions were seen as not valid. And she was told to chuck it up and suck it up and keep it pushing. And she's been doing that ever since. And um, so I just, I just pray that one day she, when she has her freedom, that she will really be able to heal from that. And I think that she will with the proper support, you know, and love around her. But yeah, I'm sure she has feelings about that. She hasn't processed yet and hasn't really came because she's been told to be objective about it and look at it like, um, you know, that it was a, it was a product of her relationship with somebody who she was with when she was in her lower self so therefore the baby that you know that's the same way that Malia and Aya think about their children oh he is a product of my relationship I had in my lower self so therefore I don't need to be there for him because he's not connected to my higher self that I need to be focused on my higher self so that's kind of like the way they try to objectively process something that's actually a very emotional thing. So. I'm going to go to, um, I'm just going to go. Cause I know I kind of just like left off in Mexico and I'm, I, I mean, no, I didn't leave off in Mexico. I left off on when I had jaw. Oh, I'm going to finish my story about how I had jaw. And then I'm going to um, just go to the questions. So. Because a lot of y'all had questions about Ja. <laughs> um, so on another note, on a, you know, a lighter note, when I saw Ja, I was so freaking happy. Oh my gosh, they made me wait until I could feel my feet so I could hold him. And as soon as I could feel my feet and my legs, I was like, they put him in my arms. And I was just like, oh my goodness, like he's just so beautiful. Um, I still, I had created him like a little baby book for his birthday last year. So I have all his pictures in that book and stuff. It's just like, I think that that was like the highlight of my life in Carbonation um, was having Jaomi. Um, man, he's just, yeah, he definitely just changed me. And I think like, bra and I know a lot of things happened after the fact, but here he comes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Keep jumping on. You know, <laughs> I am almost done. <laughs> but yes, I, I'm gonna go play with him soon because he just wants to play. <laughs> But he definitely is like the highlight of that whole situation. Like I, I, and I think that's what helped me forgive and just like move on after everything is the fact that Ja I go is jump. here and help. Ja, ja, yeah, back. Okay, bye. I go jump. Ja, ja. <laughs> That's my baby. <laughs> That's my baby. Okay, 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 okay. If you want me to stop, then you have to stop too. Okay, everybody calm down. Okay, I'm gonna come get you. Go hide. I'm playing, don't do that. Okay, let me finish and then I'll come. Let me finish. <laughs> you don't know how to stop playing. Hold on.
Sheesh. <laughs> John, obviously, he's um doing great. Not doing nothing. <laughs> Um, he, uh, somebody asked, um, uh, on my community post, and I'm sorry, y'all, now this live is all over the place, but somebody asked, uh, how is the baby doing before and after carbonation to you and Aaron? I think he's doing great now. I think that we could both say, like, he is doing really awesome. He's such a light and, like, um, he's funny He's like witty, like his dad, and um, and like his, like obviously he just loves to play and laugh, and um, he I love how he's just developing his personality and, and what he's into, and he's just and I love that he expresses himself and like I'm glad I'm so glad he wasn't raised in that environment. I think he, well, me and Aaron always say this to each other, but I think we got him out of there at the perfect time. And it wasn't even like we got him out. It was almost like he got us out of there for real. Like, I don't know. But it was just the perfect time because, you know, um, he hadn't turned three yet. Uh, so he wasn't even, I don't know. I don't even know if he really even realized what was going on around him. But he... The moment I tried to play like anything carbonation when I was back in Washington, he was just like, no, I don't want to watch that. Like, no. And so I didn't really play. I didn't really try to force it at all. And I was honestly glad not to hear it and talk about it either. Um, and I felt like I was able to finally have an uninterrupted relationship with him. Um, that I always really that I, I feel like I start it started out like that like when he was a baby it was like he was always in my arms he was always with me always had this relationship with him and then all of a sudden it was like he you know it was like he had to be with his father so how that worked was like I basically had to take care of him in the morning and then he would have to go with his father and it was really it was really like to separate me and Aaron and our family because Bishop was just you know he hated he hated family because he could because he couldn't have that and he would tell us he'd be like y'all think y'all could have your child and y'all could have a happy family here everybody's on a spiritual journey you see me in my in my situation and they keep taking my children da 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 y'all think y'all could just have y'all could be the only ones here that have a nice family and me and Aaron's like yeah like <laughs> we can because we can. but it was like he didn't want us to do it so it was like you know we always had these little side missions where we had to do, I had to, to take care of the women and be a leader and I couldn't do, you know, I couldn't be a mother and then, or I had to go take care of him and, or Aaron had to go over there and do the other stuff with the men and he couldn't be around his son. Like, but it was like when we would come together, that was like the best times of carbonation for me. When me and Aaron could come together with our child and we could just just be bro like be left alone oh my those are the best times for me but um but how jaw was when we left is jaw got right into it jaw got right into having uh cousins family who loves him like he got right into it he didn't waste no time he was like, I don't know about what that was, but this here is where it's at. That's how he was, for real. Uh, that's how he was all day. Let's see, another question from Honey Bunny. What's up, Honey Bunny? She was like, what are your thoughts, feelings? Well, or what were your thoughts? After I had job, man, I was in really a great space. Um, I was healing. Obviously, I had a cesarean, but I loved job. I just looked at him. I would stare at him all day. And Bishop would come in the room and he'd be like, can't stop looking at him, huh? And I'd be like, nope, I'm going to look at him. I'm going to sit here and look at my child all day. And then um, one night there was a meeting. Bishop called everybody to the meeting. I didn't show up because I was in the bed resting with my baby. 
And Bishop came downstairs, flipped on the lights in the room, and he's like, you think you're special? You think you can't come to the meeting? And I'm like, I just trying to go to sleep. Like, I don't know. And then I got basically um, – reprimanded and you know he started yelling at me and i just had a c-section i could barely walk up the stairs that's one of the reasons why i didn't come to the meeting <laughs> um but i was also tired obviously and he i had to come upstairs and listen to him yell at me more and then at the end of the meeting he started having um aaron flip on me too like aaron you see this she a demon da 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 and so when we went downstairs and we all went to sleep, I started looking up flights, like, how do I get out of here? And then I started thinking about the fact that my son didn't even have a passport and I didn't know how that worked. So I was like, if you don't have a passport, then we can't leave Nicaragua, right? Like, I just start thinking like, damn, how am I going to get out of here? Like, this is not going to work. And then it was somewhere around there too where that whole thing happened where they dragged um tori out and stuff so it was like all this happening at one place um and so yeah i just i ended up deciding that night after crying my eyes out that i was just gonna like try to tough this out you know and stay there and keep i didn't i, I didn't want to take jaw away from Aaron either but yeah so that was that was that's one of the first things, but I loved being a mother. I still love being a mother. It's very special. Um, and but it's better, of course, it's more special and better now because I get to decide how I want to do things. We get to decide how how we want to live as a family and um, express how we really feel and we really feel it. So. That's what's up. Any questions in the chat? I know I didn't. I know I like definitely didn't talk about like half, but it is kind of hard to talk about five years of experience in one live. And I thought it would be easier than this, but it's actually not. And I'm not trying to take up too much time. Um, y'all yeah. crazy in the chat. Oh my gosh. No. Yes. What you mean? Hold on. That was my mama. <laughs> oh, we got a lot, got a lot going on now. All right, yeah, no, he's good though. Um, he's good, man. Let me see if there's any more questions on here. Um. What are some things you find yourself still in learning? Um, I think one of the things that's really something that I think maybe I was even struggling with before the cult is um, being a people Are you done yet? Yeah, I stopped doing that. Or I'm no, like, uh, I'm done. Okay, all right. I'm done. Okay. I'm done. Okay, I'm done. okay. Done. Please, stop. Hold on. That's the main thing, y'all, that I've been learning. So be a people pleaser, man. Cause you, I just, I just realized, like I, I spent a lot of big, a large portion of my life <sighs> trying to make other people happy, um, and uh, forgetting about myself and what's important to me. So, you know, and. Um, Everybody's life looks different. My mom always tells me that, like, everybody's life looks different, you know? So I can't really measure myself to other people, and I can't 
it, you know, cater to other people, you know, what they want. So, and then, you know, obviously being a people pleaser can lead to some dangerous situations because then you condone behavior or you accept behavior and you allow behavior that's not okay and it is very destructive. So, and I'm bad. Sometimes I'm just, you know, I have to remind myself, like, just because somebody asks you if you want to go there, you don't have to say yeah. Or like, you know, like you, you don't have to be nice and be like, okay, you know, you can just be like, no, I don't want to. Or you can just say no, because no is enough too, you know, no means no. Um, somebody also asked me, oh, Veronica, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if there's going to be a part two, but there'll definitely be more lives. And I guess I'll just talk about more of my experience later on um, in a, probably another live at some point. And I think a lot of y'all, you know, I've heard a lot of things that's happened. I think, you know, it'd be a lot. Sometimes with the whole carbonation cult thing, just hearing about all the events and all the stuff, it could be a lot. And you need time away from that sometimes, too. Um, I know I do, like, just to not talk about I don't talk about this in my day-to-day -day life. That's, I literally get up on here and talk about it, and that's probably the only time I talk about it, unless I talk about it to somebody who, you know, I'm, you know, dealing with, you know, on a personal level. Like, that's another thing. When it comes to how I'm processing and how I'm healing from this and the, the work that I do, I don't really broadcast things when it comes to healing and what I do in my personal life because I just think that's an intimate personal process so but yeah I'm glad you guys are here and that you guys wanted to that you guys are listening you guys stayed you know everybody that's been on here for hours like that's what's up because I I don't know if I could I don't know <laughs> y'all been here and y'all listening to me and that's what's up um Yeah, so can you please answer what did Aaron just say? Aaron, it's hilarious. Do you think somebody asked, do I think that the cult has warped the way that I view the Bible? Um, me personally, I don't really read the Bible. I, you know, a lot of people after I left the cult, not a lot of people, but some people were like, hey, you know. This is about, let me teach you, or let me tell you about my God that I serve and stuff. And I respect that. But um, I had to, and still have to, like, develop my own spiritual relationship. And I just think that um, one other thing that I've learned is, like, I don't need to share my spiritual beliefs with people and practices with people. I've learned for me that they're very intimate practices and whatever I want to practice, as long as I'm not harming anyone, I can keep that for me. Um, I think it's beautiful when people share their practices and stuff just to share, you know, but for me, it's like, uh, -uh. <laughs> I've just learned that it's more of a, you know, I don't need to tell people like, yeah, so every day I get up and, you know, look at the sun and blink three times. Like, I don't need to tell people what I do because essentially what works for me isn't going to work for everybody anyways I don't even think you know first of all no one's alike but even two people with the same religion don't believe exactly the same thing you know everybody has a different practice so um I don't think it's warped the way that I view God I actually think it made me um ultimately healing from it has brought me to a closer connection with who I am, which, you know, then branches out into the spiritual aspects of things. So, yeah, I'm actually like, that's why I think I am able to move forward. And me and Aaron are both able to move forward in a lot of ways because we kind of can see the silver lining in it and how it's helped us develop as people. Um now we know what never to do and get involved in. And now we know what real love feels like and acceptance. And, um, you know, when somebody cares about you, it doesn't look like that. 
it looks like this, you know, and we can have more respect for ourselves and each other. It's different. You know, somebody asked me how has uh, me and Aaron, uh, our bond, has it, has the experience made our bond stronger? And I think it definitely has. And it's a, and it's a stronger bond in that we both are committed to our own personal growth. We have a stronger bond with ourselves now. So like we would never compromise our relationship with ourselves, And I think that that is the most important thing. Um, the re like the important, uh, thing that keeps our relationship strong is that we individually follow our hearts and our passions and we don't have to agree on everything in fact we prefer not to agree on everything <laughs> you know so it makes it it makes it better because we both just have what two different perspectives on life and we embrace that and um, but we also hold a lot of the similar values um, and we care about each other and our in our families a lot. And we hold a lot of pride in ourselves, in our family. So and we both have beautiful families. He's like basically part. He's a part of uh, we're both we're both a part of each other's families now. Like we're family now. So he's met everybody. I met everybody. <laughs> Aaron's crazy. He's funny. Uh, <laughs> some things, um, yeah. <laughs> BP, you are funny. Oh, somebody said, please don't project your beliefs on Kendra, especially since she had to deal with the cult leaders projections for so long. But one thing I've learned, though, is that like when people start projecting their beliefs onto you, anybody, not just me, but anybody, when people start projecting their beliefs onto you. I run. I don't walk away from those people because them is the people that mess around and form cults like they want everybody to believe what they believe. No, they better back away from me. You can believe that over there. But the moment you start protecting, yeah, because I think your purpose in life is to, no, that's your purpose in life. Go that way with that purpose, and I'll live mine. I'll be, mm-mm, mm-mm. You better be, be. <laughs> um, Somebody asked me. <laughs> Aaron okay I think that's it I think that's it um there's really nothing there's really nothing else to say my question is how long did you stay in the hospital with the cesarean section so I think it was about two days two three days it was short and me and Aaron survived off what? Peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. That that was crazy. But let me tell you something about Aaron. Aaron was so, such a great father. Like, he's such a great dad. He was sitting there. I was out of it. And he was changing diapers. And I just kept seeing him use all the wipes because he was trying <laughs> Who's trying to clean job? I'm just like, oh my gosh, I wish I could move, but I can't. I'm gonna get you. Oh. Yeah. But he's great. I'm gonna get ah. you. I'm gonna get you. You're gonna get me? Okay, so we're gonna say bye to the people now, okay? Bye. Bye, what? Bye. We're leaving now. Wait, See wait. you guys next time. What next time? <laughs> bye, what? All right, you guys. Love you guys so much. Thank you guys for being here with me. Um, yeah, maybe one day we'll talk about some more. I don't know. What are you talking? Give myself another week break. <laughs> Wait, so you have, huh? what, what? You're talking to invisible people? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> okay, you guys. See you. You're talking to a big, you're talking to a invisible people. Oh my. God.